we ready? Yes. Okay, folks, we're live. Uh, my name is Jeff Thielman. I'm the vice chair of the Arlington School Committee. Our chairman, uh, Bill Hainer, is at the Touchdown Club tonight uh, with some of our students. And so um, I'm uh, substituting for Bill until he arrives a little bit later on. <clears throat> um, a few announcements. First of all, uh, we want to have a moment of silence uh, for Catherine Zeno. She is the mother of Mary Morocco. Uh, Mary is one of the uh, secretaries here on the sixth floor, one of the administrative assistants on this floor. And so uh, we'll have a moment of silence for Catherine, her mother, who passed away this week. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I want to introduce our student representative, Mickey uh, Zaganjar. He is a junior, uh, two-year varsity letterman, power forward on the basketball team, junior class officer, school secretary, secretary of the class. That's right. Did I get that right? Yes. Siobhan Foley is the Arlington Education Association representative, and she's here. And um, <clears throat> tonight is the birthday, I, I, I won't say the number, of our administrative Secretary Karen Fitzgerald. So Karen, happy birthday. I, I remember when I turned 30 and <laughs> enjoy it. Enjoy it while it lasts. All right. Yeah, when when you started here we had to get your working papers. <laughs> um, okay, so we're gonna have a presentation on the Ed Tech conference and then public participation, and then this is the seventh grade. What am I reading here? Seventh grade, special places, group installation. Oh, that's the no. artwork. Oh, the artwork. That's the artwork. Okay. I haven't done this in a while. It's been a few years. <laughs> uh, so um, around the room, we have uh, a display called Special Places uh, by seventh grade students in Mrs. Serafini's 3D course. They chose, to, they chose a place that they felt personally connected to and then looked up a topographic map of the place online. The kids then replicated a part of that map for our, okay, thank you, oh, yeah. for our special places group installation. There will be over 100 of these works displayed together at our Odyssey Spring Art Show on May 22nd. The lesson connected to their topography unit uh, is uh, in their geography classes. All right, so there you have it. And I just came from the Bracket Art Show, so there's art going on all over the district tonight. Okay, the EdTech uh, Conference, we're gonna hear from students from the Odyssey Middle School. It's my pleasure to introduce Lillian O'Donnell and students from the 610 cluster at the Audison Middle School. These students were selected to speak at a national conference called the Tech Forum, sponsored by Technology and Learning Magazine. Um, and they were keynote speakers in the afternoon along with students from the first grade at um, Thompson Middle School, uh, Thompson Elementary School. So we were well represented and they're gonna share a little bit of their experience with you tonight. So yes, um, I'm Lillian O'Donnell. I'm the co-teacher for the 610s, and I'll just go ahead and introduce the students. This is Otto, Julia, Avril, and Owen. Um, and so we are, we're lucky enough to have the iPad pilot happen in the 610s, so each student has a one-to-one -one iPad, um, and we got started with that in November, and it's really changed uh, the way that we teach and learn in the 610s, so I thought that it would make sense for Otto and Julia to talk a little bit about how the conference went on Friday. It was really exciting for them, and then maybe Avril and Owen could talk a little bit about being on the iPad Council, which all four are a member of, so student representatives for uh, leadership opportunities. Um, hi, so uh, some of the topics we talked about um, in the tech forum were writing and research, organization, and all of the things that make iPads more efficient. Um, and so the tech, Otto's gonna tell you about what the tech forum was like. Yeah, what kind of questions did they ask you? Um, well, some of the main questions were asked, like what do we decide during the iPad council meetings? What is the iPad council? Why are we here? And why did only like the six tens get the one-to-one -one iPad pilot program? And well, the iPad council is a council that was formed by the six tens. We all had to enter a little thing about ourselves saying why we wanna be in it, why would this would be a good experience for us. And so then we all got in and what we decide on is like what thi things we could put on the iPads, what things we should take off the iPads, like unnecessary apps and things like that. 
And we also just like decide on main things, like what are some like advantages and disadvantages about them? Like are they distracting the kids during classes? Do they help us do research? Um, and also, oh, I forgot what I was gonna say. That's it. <laughs> Julia, you wanna talk maybe about the format of it? Yeah. My sources. <laughs> um, so we, sorry, what was the question? Like the format, so you were on a panel, right? And then there was also a second round where you guys sat around and they asked you questions. Yeah, so f at first we just presented, we, sep we separately had different explain everythings about different topics. And then everybody asked us questions, like Otto said. And then after that, it, it was listening to other people and what they do with the iPads. And it was really interesting. And also we make, um, we make, what's it called? Yeah, like f we make spreadsheets and forms for people to fill out. So if we have questions, if, the, if people like, verb like verbally, like, like verbally research yeah the way they like to learn so we got information like that so that helps us learn what we need to know and what we need to do with the iPads Great. so I think uh, we also got several emails from other schools wanting the students from the iPad schools to come and present because they were so impressed by them so it's very exciting already two emails two, two groups have, have reached out to us um, and really all know more since it was so exciting about how it was being implemented. I think a lot of times people are talking about what apps work, but really talking about how it's changed the climate of school. So very quickly, Avril and Owen, do you want to talk a little bit about iPad Council and what we've been um, doing? Yeah, so I'm Owen and this is Avril. And something that the iPad um, iPads have really helped us with is organization. So students' binders are less cluttered because we're not getting passed out as much paper, so that's also good for the environment. Um, and so the cool thing is, instead of passing out 116 sheets of paper, we're getting one Google Doc shared with all of us, mm -hmm. so we can all collaborate it, on it. So I'm do I just did a project with a few friends, and we, we were um, we all went to the library to work on it, and we all we had four different laptops, and we were able to. Um, all do it at the same time, and that's definitely very useful. This is a picture. This is a picture of a shared Press Google it. document. <coughs> so if you see on the right-hand side, there's comments, and people are putting input on what they like or what they think should be changed. Well, that's a great opportunity. Teachers are doing it, but also students are giving each other feedback. And that you'll find that often when they're typing, they know other students can see what they've written, that they'll put in a little more effort too. Um, Ashley, Oh yeah, so when for the creation of the iPad Cancel, we had to create a website. So we created it on Wix. Does anyone know Wix? So we, put, we created it on Wix, and we have a home page where there's lots of pictures of um, the iPads and work and how they're used in classes. And um, we have a page with our rules that we created when we first got the iPads. And we also have a page with the data we collected from the surveys we made. So we made surveys on Google Docs. And we sent it to everyone in the cluster, and they had to do it. And there were questions like, um, do you type or write faster? Do you think the iPads have helped you with projects and do, being more creative in class? Um, things like that. And we put it on the website. So there's some pretty interesting stuff there. Yeah, it's pretty cool that they did it all on their own. So just lastly, from a teacher perspective, I think the iPads have really changed in that
Thank you very much. Cindy. Uh, would you recommend that this uh, pilot move forward? Would that be your, yes. you would definitely, and you would like to see it move to other sixth grades as well as continue up with you in seventh grade? Yes. Yeah, definitely. Yeah? Yeah, I also think that maybe from all the different clusters, we could have like a group if the iPads get to all of the different classes in the school, because then there would be a whole, a wider group or a bigger group to share ideas. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you very much. Great job, guys. Thank you. Thank you. I think the highlight of the tech forum was the dessert bar. Yeah. 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 Uh, <laughs> but they, they did extraordinarily well, and people were very, very impressed. And they were um, all the other students that presented that were from other districts besides Arlington were um, high school students and uh, they called me at the last minute to say we'd really like to have elementary and middle because we had originally put in for the our high school computer programming students and I said what grade do you want and they were like you have stu uh, like yep great tell me who and so they were chosen to speak so they did oh, a great, great job terrific is there anybody here for public participation all right, we're going to move on to uh, Generation Citizen Partnership Program uh, with Carrie Dunn and her team. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Hi, thanks for having us. I'm Carrie Dunn. I'm the head of the History and Social Studies Department, K-12, but also the high school and middle school history department ed. And I'm here tonight to talk a little bit about our Generation Citizenship Program. I'll just briefly introduce it, and then I'll allow Jerry Pay and Tess Ross Callahan to talk about the program as it exists at Arlington High School. And then I'll be talking a little bit about the program as it stands as an, as an extracurricular program at the Audison Middle School. So, um, we became involved with Generation Citizen three years ago. Um, I was approached by this organization. It's a nonprofit. It's nationwide, and they have a large Boston chapter affiliated with a number of universities in the area, BU and Tufts in particular. And their mission is to improve civics education um, and to teach students how to be active citizens in their communities. Most of their partnerships are with urban districts, we're actually the only kind of urban suburban district um, that they're partnering with right now. Their initial partnership in Massachusetts was with the Malden Public Schools. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a good friend of the social studies um, K-12, my counterpart there. She recommended it highly and she had actually helped them develop their middle school program. What they do is they train university students to work as teachers and mentors in this program. So they come out once a week, these trained students, and they work with our students to develop a civic advocacy project. So our students think about something that they're interested in, something in their community they wanna change, and this university student works with them to help them flush out the idea, articulate the idea, take action on the idea, and then in the end, uh, many of our student pro programs are selected to be presented at the State House um, to actual legislatures. With that, I'll let one of our students, Tess Ross Callahan, and one of our teachers, Jerry Pay, um, talk about the program at the high school, and Tess can tell us about her individual project. Jerry Pay is a social studies teacher. He teaches grade nine modern world history, as well as our symposium elective, which is where we house this program currently. And Tess is a senior who will be heading to Tufts University in the fall. So let's start with Jerry and then Tess. Right, thank you very much. Just want to share a little bit about my experience with Generation Citizen. I teach, as Ms. Dunn said, a uh, current events elective. So we uh, examine both domestic and international policy. So when um, you know Carrie approached me about Generation Citizen, it seemed like a perfect fit because it added a third dimension of local uh, policy, local activism. And so typically, um, as Carrie said, 
uh, college students come once a week and they teach our students about uh, lobbying, uh, how to be an advocate for a cause, how to use social networks uh, to promote a cause. And it, I've seen it really gives um, students a voice. Uh, oftentimes they feel powerless uh, to enact any kind of real change. So the, the program really encourages students um, and teaches them how to talk to adults, and to uh, administrators and community members uh, in order to um, enact change. And so it kind of turns their powerlessness into having more of a voice. And even though our projects are, are pretty small scale, we, all, we do a class project and they range from anti-bullying initiatives to recycling initiatives to, as has to talk about career education. Uh, they're pretty small scale projects, but I think it, the students can build upon that uh, down the road. Um, and maybe with this civics education, they will then in turn one day, you know, attend school committee meetings and town hall meetings and, uh, you know, promote change and activism at their colleges and beyond. So I think it's a great program about uh, just really emphasizing the importance of civics, that students, uh, you know, have a voice, that they are, uh, that they, you know, we educate them about, you know, being informed and knowledgeable, but I think the program encourages them to uh, take that extra step and better the community and better schools through uh, their knowledge and, and their um, experiences. So um, that's about it. Thank you for your time. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Tess. Is this cool? um, um, uh, like Ms. Dunn said, um, I'm a senior this year. Um, and what that means, obviously, is that I have just completed the college process. Um, and I don't know how many of you have kids who have just gone through that or if you've just gone through it yourself. But, um, it, well, it's, it's, you know, it's a big one. But um, they have this thing. Um, every school has this thing called Accepted Students Day. Um, and that's basically where they invite the kids there and they have activities fairs and they try to recruit you to come to their school. And I was at one of these accepted students days recently um, and I saw someone I thought I knew. And I looked at her and I was trying to figure out who it was and I realized um, it was Emily and she had been our, my mentor for Generation Citizen. She had been the woman who came and helped us with our, um, what they call uh, it's the action issue. Um, which, is, which was, as Mr. Pei said, um, career education. Um, and so we did that sort of like weird eye contact, like I remember you, do you remember me? And then she came out um, and gave me a big hug and I said, um, are you still a democracy coach? And she said no and I was disappointed and she said actually now I'm leading an advocacy group, um, which is sort of a step up in the program. And at first I was kind of surprised because Emily had started Generation Citizen as a freshman in high school, uh, in, in college, um, and she was almost our age when she came to our class, and so she had requested to work with middle schoolers, um, which they also do. And she had sort of ended up with this, you know, this older um, boy who was, who was working with her and it hadn't really gone how she'd planned, and yet here she was, she was going further and further in the program. And then I thought about it and realized that it's actually, it's not that surprising because that story, um, that story about uh, where you, you sort of try Generation Citizen on a whim and then fall in love with it and keep going, like I know that story because it's my story. Um, I found that um, though I had started Generation Citizen mm -hmm. just because I needed an extra class to fill the block that I was missing in my fall semester, um, pretty soon it was kind of the best part of my day. Um, I would come into class and it was the first class I had that was really, it was just like completely unlike anything else. There were no notes, there were no tests, um, and I would actually talk. You don't realize how many classes um, as, a, as a junior in high school are just this formula of, of um, notes, lectures, test. And that's necessary for success, but I realized how little I was talking each day except at lunch. And then in this class, we were all, I mean, literally using our voices, but also developing our voices um, sort of in the broader sense of learning how to advocate for a cause. And that meant so much to me. And pretty soon, um, I was asked to use my voice um, 
to talk at the State House. Um, and so when we went to present our project to the Board of um, Legislators, as, as Ms. Dunn was describing, um, they also had me give a keynote speech in front of a bunch of big, scary, important people. Um, and I was really nervous, and it actually it went really well. And um, this past fall, I only applied to schools that were participating in Generation Citizen because I'm so excited about being a democracy coach next year. And I bothered Mr. Pei until he got us t-shirts for Generation Citizen. Um, and I frequently like look at their website to check out the news and to practice the application because I can't actually start it until I'm a college student, but I'm, I'm excited about it. Um, and I think, you know, it's really, it's amazing that this, this program can be not only like the best part of someone's day and such an empowering change, it can also become the map for your future. And that's what it became for me. So thank you. Can you just, what was your project? That you uh, we were doing um, career education in the high school. Um, so that was where we tried to sort of, I guess you would say, revise an existing program, the capstone program, uh, to be sort of better known throughout the school and community and more accessible to the students. Um, and it actually ended up winning a grand prize at the State House, so that was cool. So our program at the high school has just been a smashing success. And Generation Citizen, this organization we've partnered with, um, has been very, very pleased with it. Not surprisingly, they loved working with Jerry Pay, and they wanted to expand their um, activities in Arlington because they'd had such a positive partnership with us so far. So I suggested the middle school, and they actually changed their model for us. So in Jerry's class, they go into the classroom once a week into his regular class. Um, but at the middle school, it doesn't really fit with our curriculum where we do ancient civ, world geography, and then an early world history class. Um, an American civics component doesn't mesh in there. So my suggestion to them was, could you make it an after school module um, that is an extracurricular opportunity for our kids? So they actually worked really hard all summer to, to redesign their program to work that way. Um, we then put it together, Eric stepped up to be the advisor. He's going to talk a little bit about the program and some of what his students have put together and the projects they've worked with. But it's, it's filled a great niche. We've had terrific participation at the middle school after school. I think it's addressing also a hidden achievement issue, an equity issue, where uh, students who have means who are middle schoolers go home to all sorts of rich activities that their parents sponsor them for. Um, this is something that's wonderful and it's really rich and it's open to everyone and it costs nothing. Um, so, you know, it's been a terrific addition to, I think, the Audison Middle School experience for many students as a result. So I'll let Eric talk about how the program works there as an extracurricular and some of the projects that his students have put together. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having us come and speak. Um, it's really an amazing program that we do. And one of the things that I think is most amazing about it is that the students get to show what they've been working on at the end. And not often enough does the community get to see what's going on in our schools. And especially at the middle school, whenever someone from the community, we had a newspaper um, journalist come in to do an interview with the students, he was so amazed at how professional these students could be. He thought that their maturity, the way that they approached the issues, and the ideas that they came up with were really great. And I'm privileged, a lot of us are privileged, to work with the young students of Arlington and see that. And it's just an amazing opportunity for them to show that to the community as well. Um, so the way that it works at Audison is it's an after-school program. Um, uh, the students, I had originally thought about doing sort of a an interview process, see if the students were willing to make the commitment. <clears throat> and we wound up leaving it as an open invitation for any students who are interested. And the numbers, the first year had a big meeting, the opening meeting, and then there were less students. And then the second year that I've run it this year, it's increased as we've gone along. We've picked up more kids who have heard about it and, and how interesting it was. So it does take a commitment from the students, and their time, um, and in their research. And we're very careful, 
I try to make sure that there's not too much work outside of the meeting times for students because I want to be respectful of their other activities. And what they're capable <coughs> of accomplishing <coughs> is really amazing stuff. They take a, um, a f the first meetings, the first half of our series of meetings, they learn all about the government, they learn about the levels of government, federal, state, and local government, all the different um, potential avenues for change. And they discuss different issues. If you wanted to change something like X, where would you go? Is that appropriate to talk to the president about? Because that's everyone's first guess. We should write a letter to the president. <laughs> um, so how do you best affect change? And it's just a terrific opportunity for the students to learn about our government, about civics, and then the best part is they do something about it. The issue that they chose our first year was um, cleaning up Monotony Rocks Park. And um, I have a presentation, a couple pictures, I'm not sure if you'll be able to see them too well, everybody, but uh, those are some students at the State House. Sorry, Carrie. <laughs> yeah, uh, so those are some students at the State House, and if you can see, they have a big tree-shaped brochure a big uh, tree-shaped presentation in the background. So they wanted to get trash barrels put into Monotony Rocks Park just to help with the litter and other issues. And they really correctly identified it as sort of a symbol of Arlington. Um, so they, they banked on that. This year they decided to try to work on some of the uh, street crossings, pedestrian safety. Arlington's a wonderful community. I felt that way since I first started working here. You can really sense the, the community. And the students are part of that. And part of walking around and biking builds that community. And so they thought that this would be an important thing that people would get really excited about to try to make Arlington more walkable. Mm -hmm. um, and so the Park Ave that goes from Route 2 to Mass Ave, uh, there's an elementary school on one side and the middle school on the other. And a lot of students cross Park Ave every day to pick up younger siblings or drop them off. And so they were concerned about um, those crossings. So they called the newspaper, they went on Arlington Public Access TV. I don't know if any of you saw, but it was really an amazing interview that was conducted by someone who did Generation Citizen the year before, mm -hmm. um, Guidry, and she, she does an awesome job editing it and everyone was really very professional during that time. Um, so we presented at the State House. Um, these are some pictures that I took from that day. And the students, again, as Ms. Dunn said, cute middle school kids dressed up in suits. <laughs> um, but they really were very professional um, and they did an amazing job presenting and we won an award, the Action Award. So the first year we, we won the um, Change Makers Award, sorry. <laughs> um, so the s students were recognized as being empowered to make change in their community. And then this year's war award, they got more specific with their award categories. Out of uh, 43 groups presenting, uh, the Odyssey Middle School students won the Action Award for identifying and taking the most uh, steps towards reaching their goal, targeting appropriate people. They, they go over ideas of what you can do, and our students went to do all of them. They tried to be successful in every way they could. And in the end, I told them, it doesn't really matter whether you win or lose, it's how you play the game. And I think that this award really emphasized that for them. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Are there, are there any questions? Anybody have any questions? All right. You want to say something? I just wanted to thank you, Eric and Jerry, for being here. And of course, um, uh, I wanted to ask you how many students participated in your class, Jerry, and how many in your class, Eric? Or in your, in your club? So this year we had about 15 students. Um, it was about the same number last year. And my classes tend to just vary by enrollment, but anywhere from, you know, by average about 20 students get involved each, um, each semester. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. There is a question on the school plan. Yeah, I missed sorry. it. My left, um, I'm assuming that this will go on next year. It sounds great. Mm -hmm. If kids are interested in either enrolling in the class or, or participating, how would they get in touch? How would they find out? Well, if they we're actually concluding our course enrollment process at Arlington High School now, but any student can take our symposium and current world issues class that Jerry teaches. It, 
it has no prerequisites. It's open to all. Um, we always get great, great numbers in it. Um, I think the word is out that it's a terrific class and it's really interactive and experiential, which many of our students are looking for. It's also a heterogeneous class. So they're in the same classroom, but they can take it for either honors weight or curriculum A weight. So we have a full range of students from all different backgrounds in that class getting this generation citizen experience, learning how to be community activists. Um, so they can talk to Jerry about it and he'll tell them take the class. Okay. Um, so it was symposium in Symposium what? in current world issues. Current and then world, okay. to join the club. So I, I do extensive advertising to my own students. Um, and then I also put up flyers around the school beforehand. There's a website and the students get a list of all after school activities mm -hmm. and Generation Citizen is one of them. So the awareness at the middle school is increasing. Every year we get a little better about publicizing it um, so that more than just the students that have me telling them about it in the morning is all exciting to come. But uh, yes. So. Okay. So they would look for Generation Citizen. I mean, that's what you're calling the group. Yes. I okay. call it Generation Citizen. Okay. Just to make Great. it straightforward. Thank you. <laughs> Well, I, I have to say this is impressive, and, uh, and I like the story of starting at the president and then redirecting, and I'm really impressed because that's where my heart is, that you have ended up in a nice local government issue. Uh, so have, what's their reaction as they move from the president to 252 town meeting members five selectmen, a town manager, a DPW director, a school committee, and other such people who are governing things in town. I'll let Eric answer that, but I, I will say I was at the DPW last year for another purpose, for placing an intern, and the director did say, are you the one sending me all those middle school kids? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, no, they are coming on their own. <laughs> Um, so, I, you know, I think it's really important that students don't get a sugar-coated version of the world mm -hmm. and that they're prepared to go out into our society and mm -hmm. be successful. And so in many ways, I think that that's what they're running into with that mm -hmm. situation going on. But then I also feel like at the end of the day, they feel a little more heard. Mm -hmm. If you get a, write a letter to the president, you're going to get a generic letter back. If you call someone and he laughs at you because you're a middle school student, hangs up the phone, but then sees your email, gets another letter from, you know, a message from his secretary that you've called again, it shows them persistence mm -hmm. in a way that I don't think you could be persistent mm -hmm. with the president or with a senator. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that it teaches them really valuable lessons about mm -hmm. making real change. Mm -hmm. But you're right, there is a little mm -hmm. disillusionment to that. <laughs> I, I, I'm sort of interested in, uh, in seeing our first warrant article in the annual town meeting from Generation Citizen. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I expect that it'll be coming. <laughs> <laughs> Great job. Thank you and, very and, much. And Jeff, I, um, I also want to thank Carrie Dunn for, for bringing this to Arlington. It's really terrific. It's, it's a wonderful experience. And I wish you the, the most uh, success next year at, at Tufts. And I hopefully you'll come back and maybe be a mentor here. Perhaps, maybe. So. You're close by. <laughs> All right, thank you very much for coming this evening. So now we're going to hear about district determined measures in uh, social studies and world languages with Carrie Dunn and Catherine Ritz. I think both at the same time, yeah. Mm -hmm. So come on up. If you don't mind, I can go first. Go ahead. Okay. All right. So there should be in your packet a handout from me. And that's something that I think could be put on the school committee website mm -hmm. if people wanted to view it at home. Okay. okay. All right. So I'll talk a little bit about our district determined measures as we've enacted them in the history and social studies department um, at the secondary level. So just stating the obvious here, 
one of the reasons, um, um, and the initial reason why we are implementing these this year is that uh, this is um, part of a state and a larger federal initiative that's, that's mandated. Um, however, I think we have tried to seize the opportunity here to do something really good for teachers and students in Arlington. Um, and it's been an opportunity for teachers in the History and Social Studies Department to collaborate with one another, to build some even more, I think, I, I think we're already quite good in this area, but um, to build even more consistency from teacher to teacher between teachers of the same subject, same grade. And something that we really had to do anyways with the implementation of the new ELA Common Core for technical subjects, which includes history and social studies, um, this was an opportunity for us to develop some new assessments that really measured skills that were emphasized in the adoption of the new Common Core. So, this did involve a fair amount of change for us. Uh, we actually went into this process thinking we were in great shape. Uh, we already had common assessments. So we had at least three common assessments in every grade. We had a technology-based assessment. We had a research skills-based assessment. In the upper grades, that was a kind of a classical research paper. And we had a common final exam. Um, so we thought, hey, we can just use those. It turned out that we couldn't, um, and that was fine. Um, it, was a, it was a good opportunity for us to change and grow. Um, and the reason why we couldn't was because really the purpose of a district determined measure is to show growth with one, in one school year. And in order to do that, you need to have paired measures um, so you can see growth over the course of a year. Um, and none of our existing common assessments were actually paired. So we could have paired them. Um, you know, we could have done something like give our final exam the first week of school and lo and behold, the kids did much better at the end of the year. But that didn't seem very genuine and we thought we could do a lot better than that. I think that probably is what is occurring elsewhere, but um, we, we thought we could certainly do better than that. And again, coming back to the implementation of the new ELA Common Core, we saw this as an opportunity um, to do some good work here. So we really decided to focus the development of our district determined measures on the area of research skills. This is something no matter what field a student ends up in, um, it's going to be important to them, even in just daily life, being able to evaluate information, determine the validity of information, compare sources um, to substantiate your opinion um, or a claim with evidence is important in all fields. Um, so we saw it as being something that was very, very relevant beyond just the area of history um, that we teach. Also, there are a lot of other skills um, that are emphasized throughout the ELA Common Core that can be embedded in research skills instruction. So there's a lot of nonfiction reading. Um, there's persuasive and informational writing. There's developing a claim and substantiating it with evidence. So in this handout, I pulled out the ELA standard um, for writing and literacy that we most use, um, which is research to build and present knowledge. Um, but there certainly are other ELA skills that we're emphasizing in the process of doing that. Um, we're also working quite heavily along the ideas of developing an understanding of citation all right, why we cite, how to cite, why it's important, not just in history class, but in other activities throughout life to cite. So, we've put together two sets of assessments. Um, and I've got a little two-page handout here that walks you through grade by grade, the first pairing and the second pairing. All of these are teacher developed. We're not using any sort of packaged products, right? So these are all things that Arlington teachers have developed that they think are grade level appropriate, appropriate for their students, connect to the curriculum that we actually teach in that grade. The first pairing we've implemented, we planned last year and we've implemented this year. So the students have had the first assessment and in most cases they're either taking the second assessment now um, or they will take it shortly. Um, We've also planned the second pairing, which will be implemented next year. Right? So I won't read this aloud to you, right? but um, we're looking at different skills within the research skills umbrella. Right? Um, 
again, varying from grade to grade, looking at differentiating between a primary and secondary source, analyzing primary sources, developing a claim and substantiating it with evidence, analyzing a visual source, identifying bias, identifying point of view, and in all of these activities, we ask students to do that by displaying their own knowledge and putting a particular source in context of that period in history and time and who the speaker was and what their perspective might be. As far as what we are going to do with the data, that's, you know, that's very interesting and that could make this very purposeful as well. We've already used our first assessment along with other assessments that we give as a formative assessment to address mm -hmm. particular student needs who, of students who it was clear from their first assessment had a great deal of growth to make in their understanding of that particular research skill measure. We'll be very interested in looking at growth that's occurred between the beginning of the year and the end of the year in June. We have some, some departmental meeting time in June that we'll use for that purpose. We'll be interested next spring in the second pairing and seeing how the data is different between the first and the second. Um, that's the point when we can start really to develop kind of cohorts. We've, we've realized already there is one change we'll have to make. We've got a great plan for our assessments. Um, we do need to have standard measures from year to year that we're using um, so we can potentially down the road um, look at growth from year to year, not just across one year. Um, so that's a little change we'll be making, but not changing the actual assessments for next year. Um, so our use of the data is going to become more sophisticated as time goes on um, and more actionable as time goes on. That's what I've got, so I, I'm interested to see if you have any questions or comments or ideas right. for us. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I just have a question about what the research skills test is and, and how does it differ? It's, I assume then it's not the same test. It's not. It's, the, yeah, we wouldn't give a sixth grader and a ninth grader the same one. Right. Oh, no, no. Six, so beginning of sixth grade and the end of sixth grade, are they getting the same test in that case? Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, they are. So For is these it, is ones, it like they a are. choice test? Is it a practical test? Is it? Um, they all use multiple measures, um, so there actually are some, some just multiple co choice questions where maybe there's a, a, something that should be, students should be able to tell is actually a primary source and they have to select whether it is or isn't. Um, same thing with the secondary source. Um, there's ci some citation formatting questions, um, um, whether you need to cite something or not. Um, students have to write a, a couple of short pieces. Um, as part of it. Um, we're using actual um, Google Forms for all of them, so it really makes it very nice to, uh, to, compare. to organize the data and to look at the data and for the teachers to, to use it. So, um, but they are different from grade to grade. Mm -hmm. um, the, you know, the ninth grade one is, is more complicated and challenging than the sixth grade one, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. Good. So what's your metric for growth? How are you determining growth? Well, that's where we're looking at changing the actual measures. So. The, and that's something that we also need to talk about with Laura and between department eds too and see if, to what degree that should be standardized from department to department and DDM to DDM because there hasn't been clarity from the state that I've seen on that measurement of growth. Right. Um, so really right now we're focusing on making them manageable, manageable and meaningful. Mm -hmm. So we want to make sure that we're assessing the, some of the most important concepts or ideas that we teach in that grade and make it manageable so that if, if it's too unwieldy, teachers will give it just to get through the hoop, mm -hmm. um, but they're not going to look at the data or they're going to try to look for a way to get out of it. And um, so we, we really need to make it you know, definitely doable, and that's one of the things that we're looking at. Um, in terms of uh, it being this consistent, that will be something we'll have to take a look at at the data over time. Yeah, I, I think this is a, uh, a difficult thing to do, and it's going to take a couple of years no matter where you are, especially if you don't have the benefit of a parallel uh, measure such as MCAS or something else with a norm attached to it. Uh, to get it done. So let me ask, and I'm just throwing these out, not because you're going to have the answer to this. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a big question. I mean, it's one we've been thinking about, too. And I, I mean, these are the questions that I'm thinking about, too, mm -hmm. uh, in my day job. And, uh, and I'm not laying them out to be difficult, because they are the difficult questions. Mm -hmm. I'm laying it out because 
these are the things we really need to be thinking about uh, professionally. And, uh, and by reflecting on them, we, we will be, as years progress, refining the DDMs so that they come to a better part. So my next question is, if you're doing a pre-test, post-test model, uh, and uh, a cohort of kids comes and blows through the pretest with, uh, get, you know, at the top of every rubric you've got, how are you going to measure growth then? Yeah, I think, I think that's the failing of every uh, measure of this sort, um, mm -hmm. unless there's something that you've thought of that I have not. But we have, um, actually, I, I actually think the answer there is really on the, the assessments that and it's a good thing that we have two, are not the actual kind of classical pre-test, post-test, research mm -hmm. skills based. Um, I think where you're actually going to be able to see growth mm -hmm. by even the most advanced student mm -hmm. is something like, for example, what the grade 10 students are doing, um, where they're writing a primary source document analysis of the May Mayflower Compact at the beginning year when they study that, and writing a primary source document analysis of the Gettysburg Address at the end of the year when they study that. Um, you will see growth mm -hmm. there. Um, and there's no limit to it or specific percentile measure of mm -hmm. growth um, the way that there might be with a classical, you know, multiple choice test or, um, or growth. Because that's really one of the important things we have to face when we're trying to differentiate for high achieving students. And uh, when you're trying to construct, it, it's tough enough when you're constructing a growth mu uh, measure statistically, like uh, the growth scores attached to the MCAS. But when, you, when you're trying to do it on a local measure and you've got the, the level of great teaching and high achieving students we've got moving through this this district this this is a real challenge and and I hope you're not discouraged when uh, you find kids who are trying to go and subvert your whole plan by doing too well yeah so I, I would say our answer to that is the writing based assessments mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. every student can can show authentic growth mm -hmm. um, whereas something that is objective mm -hmm a top student can come in and, and, and score a 10 out of 10 on the first shot, and then where do we go from there with the mm -hmm. post-test? Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh. um, I had a few quick questions. Um, first, are the kids going to be graded on the results of their tests? Okay. In some cases, we are actually using the DDM, and this is my favorite thing to do, as just uh, th they get a score on it for the DDM purposes. They never really see that score, but then it actually is just on their test, their unit test or their unit assessment. Mm -hmm. So when they were studying the Mayflower Compact anyways, they fully should have expected, their teacher probably told them that that would be a document that would, they would have to analyze mm -hmm. on their unit test, so it's right on there, mm -hmm. and that's where they're writing about it. So the teacher is actually giving a measurement for the purpose of the DDM, but then it's just captured as part of the student's regular assessment. Um, I like that because it's not adding an assessment on to an assessment. Um, mm -hmm. It's authentic, it's purposeful, it feels like it's important to kids. Um, and um, there are other assessments that we're doing. Our pre-test, post-test, those are just for our own information. Those are mainly with our younger students, um, our middle school students, who, uh, you know, they, they take it seriously. They want to do well. They want to show their teacher what they know. The teacher tells them that actually, specifically, it's not graded. So don't stress about this. Just do your best. This is for me to know what I need to teach this year. Um, and I think the kids, kid, the kids buy that and, and believe it, and it's it's good information to see at the end of the year where there has been growth. Mm -hmm. um, then, for the writing assessments, are there going to be standard rubrics that the teachers will grade against? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so those so we have we put in place between teacher mm -hmm. and, and. Yeah. So those we did put in place when we designed the assessment. We also designed the paired rubric to go with it for the writing assessments. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then finally, just looking at the example for grade six um, for the second the. The second DDM, where the first assessment is at the beginning of Mesopotamia and the second is at the end, isn't that going to be affected? I mean, won't the results be affected by the learning that's undergone during that time about the area and the civilization? And so, won't, aren't you kind of grading, looking at two different things at the same time with that? There is a little bit of that, yes. And um, the teachers felt strongly, and I, I actually agreed with them that they saw this as, as um, an authentic use of a pretest, post-test. I mean, that's the case with any pretest and post-test. Um, they're learning, you know, you're going to see, hopefully, that they learned a lot and are able to do a lot more in the post than the pretest. This just happens to be a writing example of that. Um, 
Right. I guess I'm saying what I'm thinking is that if you're, you're trying to understand is whether students can learn from primary sources if their ability to use the primary sources is more that they fleshed out the background. Mm -hmm. That doesn't seem as genuine an assessment of whether they're learning from primary sources to I, me. I would say that this is similar to um, although not exactly the same, similar to the MCAS in, in the sense that we test students' ability to read a passage and do literary analysis. It's not the same passage from year to year, yet we look at those, those scores on those to determine the student's growth score. Mm -hmm. So in much the same way, I understand that this is, this is slightly heavier on content, although there, if there's a difference in the difficulty of a literary piece of work, then you may get a different result from the student in their in but you what you're trying to get at is their skill as opposed to content so this would be an example of where we test both content and skill the content for the unit but the skill for their ability to look at a primary source document and and use the information that's in there they have to provide evidence and correct me please if i'm wrong carrie that but they have to provide evidence from the document not just what they learned in the class and Kersey, I would say you're absolutely right, and that's the only grade where we're doing exactly what the state wants us to do. Okay, <laughs> um, thank you. So those are two kind of incongruous thoughts, but that's, okay. that's the case. That's interesting and helpful, thank you. Jennifer, you had your hand up. Oh yeah, um, I was just curious to, um, how teachers are using this to inform their own teaching. So are they comparing it with other instructors to see where they sort of succeeded and where they may need work? are they comparing it across time um, sort of how do they see it as a useful tool for them to develop sort of more effective teaching strategies or right now it's actually only thus far because we are, we're at where we are in the the, the process just we're just different. implementing right. the second measure right now it's only been really useful but I would say it has been quite useful as a formative assessment so so highlighting knowledge gaps that the class might have collectively mm -hmm. that you need to address with everyone and highlighting issues that particular students might have where um, you know you may have had a handful of students who just didn't do well at all on this and then at the other end of the spectrum you had those students who just blew it out of the water the first shot um, and maybe particularly at the middle school level you need to give them some stretch assignments and and opportunities um, rather than reteaching something that they already know well um, so they've used it for that purpose once we start looking at the, the data that's when i think it will be interesting to see how different cohorts of students are doing, mm -hmm. um, and it will be something that teachers have to think about and see uh, maybe somebody's students were particularly strong in an area, sure, and sure. they can talk to that, that person. Mm -hmm. We're not quite there yet, but we're very close to being there. Mm -hmm. okay. Great. Thank you very much. Catherine, you're on. Thank you, Carrie. Great job, as always. Good evening, everyone. Um, is that PowerPoint? Is it open? Um, so I will start with a little bit of a background into um, how we approach the common assessments, and I have to give you a little bit of a background into uh, word language education. So when we um, approached uh, development of our common assessments, we didn't have any. So I actually think this was fortuitous, so we could really start um, where we wanted to be. So we started by looking at the um, national standards from ACFL, the American Council for the Teaching of Foreign Languages. They have three major um, standards, the three modes of communication, which is what they're called in world languages, the interpersonal mode, which is two people interacting with each other, either through speaking or email, the interpretive mode, which is um, one-way communication where you're really receiving information. So right now you all are experiencing the interpretive mode of communication. You're, I'm speaking to you and you're listening. Or you might be reading a text and you have to interpret what it says. And the presentational mode, which is what I am doing right now, is it's one-way communication again, either speaking or writing where you've prepared something that you're speaking um, about or writing about. So we decided to approach our um, common assessments focusing on these three modes. Um, the first one that we worked on, the interpretive communication, this is not one of our district determined measures, but this is just um, common assessment. 
Um, so what we did is we took, um, for each language, we found authentic passages. Um, and in world languages, when we say authentic um, materials, that means materials created by native speakers for native speakers. So not me, a non-native French speaker, creating a text for my students that would be adapted to their level. It's just authentic, like you would find in the streets of France or Madrid or wherever. Um, so here you have a small um, example from a graphic um, organizer that has information about creativity in Spanish. So students have to read this and then they're asked questions trying to interpret what they see. And the questions are focused on, for example, main idea, supporting details, um, trying to um, infer the meaning of a word that they might not know from the context, uh, those types of things. So that's half of the assessment is reading. The other half is listening. Um, so, for example, um, in French, I think this is French 2, we ha found a video clip on how to make creme brulee with a certain chocolate, and the kids have to listen to it and try and figure, you know, and they have to answer multiple choice questions about what they hear. Um, so, again, it's really just interpreting um, what they're either reading or listening to. Um, the second two common assessments we decided to turn into our district determined measures because they are performance assessments. Um, so just to give you a quick um, background into the way that we set these up in order to track proficiency, again we looked to ACTFL and ACTFL has a proficiency scale that moves students up from novice to intermediate to advanced and then superior is um, not a level that's particularly attainable in the high school um, or in a K-12 uh, program. Uh, novice students, to give you a visual, a novice speaker is what we think of as like a parrot, so they're really just repeating memorized phrases and expressions or words. There's a lot of word listing, you know, what's your favorite food, and they'll list words of, or list, lists of food. Um, the intermediate speaker is a survivor so they can kind of get by in a slightly more complex situations. And the advanced speaker we think of as our storyteller, so they can really describe what's happened and what was going on, and they're talking in different tenses and so on. So we decided to use this scale um, as the way to kind of build students up and figure out, and, and we set um, ex expectations for each level. So at the end of level one, French, Spanish, um, Italian, we would expect students to be either a novice mid or a novice high level. And then the next year, our expectation is that, that they've moved up to a novice high, intermediate, low, you know, and, and up and up. And students in AP would probably hit advanced low um, on the proficiency scale. So the first, um, the interpersonal assessment, um, which is our first district determined measure, um, I believe I gave you some samples, and my absolute favorite um, assessment, and, and the kids can have these ahead of time, it really doesn't make any difference because when they actually have to speak, it's, they have no notes, no script, it's just off the cuff, you have to um, just go and start speaking. And my favorite, um, Spanish 1, for example, and actually for all the level 1 languages, it's exactly the same, um, they, they basically in pairs, introduce yourself, greet your friend, ask them a couple questions, where are you from, how old are you, what do you like to do on the week, I mean really kind of basic conversations and then in Spanish 4, which I believe our student representative is in the Spanish 4 class, um, it jumps from, you know, hello my name is to um, discuss current environmental problems that concern you and your partner, endangered animals, climate change, energy and so on and it's like, so that's really what we're hitting. I just think that that's amazing, um, that the progression from kind of learning basic language skills to like discussing important topics in the language that you're studying. Um, if I have, a, do I have enough time to show a quick clip? If you'd yeah. be interested, okay. We learn how to make creme brulee. <laughs> <laughs> um, only if you speak French. Yeah. <laughs> No, something's wrong. Is there a speaker to attach? Yeah, the speaker to attach. Speak. Oh boy. 
doesn't like math. saying what they like and don't like to do. They don't like math. <laughs> Everybody likes math. Some the person on the left was a teacher. No, no, that was another no. student. Oh, oh. Yeah. Um, it's between two students. Yeah, the student on the left. So that's a Spanish one high school. Um, two students. Yeah. So it's always between two students. So yeah, I think it's fantastic. Um, and actually, um, I think it's really exciting um, the connection that teachers have made with their uh, student achievement goals this year through the teacher evaluation system. I think. Almost half of the teachers in my department chose to focus on interpersonal communication as their student achievement goal, and they decided to use the department rubric that we developed as the way that they were tracking progress towards achieving that goal. So I thought that was really nice. And typically, I think traditionally, there's been too much emphasis on writing in foreign languages. So to have this, um, I think, really shifts the focus of what we're doing in a very important way. Um, the third common assessment, which is our second district determined measure, is on presentational communication and we focused on the skill of writing. Um, so similar to the interpersonal communication, the students get a prompt um, and they are expected to write on that prompt. Um, so for, and they would write in class, um, prepare the essay, um, whatever length is appropriate on whatever topic. So again, if it's Spanish one or French one, it'd be probably tell me things you like to do or um, tell me you know, what you do at school or the classes you take. Um, and then as it goes up, um, they would be able to talk like tell me what you did over the summer or using past tense or things that you want to do in the future. Um, for obviously this, these three um, common assessments are for the modern languages that we have. So in the high school, Italian um, uh, and also middle and high school, Mandarin, French, Spanish. And we also have, um, yes, that's right. and the high school, we also have um, Latin. So Latin, um, obviously, we wouldn't use these three modes of communication. Um, and the most important skill um, that the Latin teachers uh, focused on is on translations. So all of their common assessments and district determined measures focus on progress, um, the way that students progress doing translations, moving from sign of simplified Latin texts all the way up to quote unquote real Latin. Um, and again, we developed rubrics um, that mirrored the actual proficiency scale to show kind of student progression over the years. So, any questions? Go ahead, Tracy. So I was interested in your, your this thing, the chart. Yes. Uh, yeah. So there aren't, I mean, I think it makes sense what you're saying and to have the levels. This doesn't exist already I mean like isn't there like a national organization of foreign language teachers who mm -hmm. come up with I mean I'm, I'm thinking of the, all the reading leveled reading things and that doesn't already exist um, are you talking about reading specifically no, no, no. or I'm just in about, general I'm talking about so there, foreign there language. are uh, so actful uh, recently came out with what's called the apple assessment if that's so it's a, exactly this where you're assessing um, 
students in the different modes of communication and skills on the proficiency scale. There's also a national stamp assessment, which does the exact same thing. Um, the stamp assessment and Apple run $20 per student, mm -hmm. so it's not something that the district could afford. However, um, Dr. Chesson is supporting um, for us to test 30 students in French, 30 students in Spanish to, to norm ourselves to make sure that what we are coming up with through these assessments match that. Okay. Um, so unfortunately, I think it's just cost prohibitive, um, okay. the assessments that already exist. Okay. Uh, the other you. thing, we, we've had offers from a couple of, at least one other school district to compare our stamp results with theirs so that we can build a bigger norming database. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and we would all do it with the small, same small number of students to make it cost efficient for okay. all the districts. Okay. Right. Great, thank you. Uh, I, I just, uh, you know, I, it may be easy, easier to do this in learning a second language than it is in measuring certain other things uh, because there is a progression in building language proficiency mm -hmm. in terms of acquiring vocabulary and being able to communicate and being able to put things together. But what you have shown us is really a nice logical progression mm -hmm. and I think that you're going to get some really good DDMs out of this. I, I, I think this is going to be uh, the framework for building valid and reliable measures that are going to uh, mm -hmm. enable us to look at uh, uh, teaching and learning. So congratulations. Thank That's you. Yeah. Well We're excited about them. So. Miguel. Fala <laughs> hablar en español? Un poco de español? Ok. Ok. ¿Puedes hablarnos sobre los problemas en el medio ambiente? Sí. Give me mic. Tenemos cosas buenas en el medio ambiente, pero... ¿Cuáles son los problemas en el medio ambiente, Miguel? Sorry. Medio ambiente es environment, ok. Los problemas en el medio ambiente son como... ¿Cómo se dice? Los... Por ejemplo, los animales en los zoológicos. Uh -huh. Esto es un poco de medio ambiente. Yo, nosotros, uh, clase de Señora Toro, uh -huh. en Español 4, Buena hicimos profesora. un uh -huh. proyecto de solo uh, animales y hablamos de los zoológicos y que son buenos, que son malos de estos y uh, escribimos una uh, letra, un a letter, uh, como un uh, persuasivo y de hablar que es bueno de zoológicos, que es malo y que uh, se necesita uh, cambiar. Ah, y esto bien. es un ejemplo de que hicimos. Ah, muy bien. He was saying that there, he, he, so I asked him about problems in the environment and um, Mickey said that, <coughs> Good job on the spot, kiddo. Uh, there was, Excellent. There was, I'm never going to come back. Excellent. That was it. That was it. I, I, I know. But he, he, he handled it so well. This kid is great. He did. This kid, he's great. He's great. You handled it very well. But he was talking about uh, problems in zoos and the problems that uh, zoos, did I get that right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Problems in the zoos. And he wrote a letter. To, who'd you write? Una carta? Uh, we wrote a una carta para... Should I say in Spanish or in English? <laughs> <laughs> you know Spanish. Do it in English. He's been trained think, well. Uh, this is good. <laughs> uh, no, yeah. um, we wrote a persuasive letter, uh, either taking a side on the positive aspects of, of zoos and the negative aspects. But in regardless of which letter you wrote, you had to hint on both of them. So personally, I took the negative aspect because one of the first the first articles that Miss Toro or Mrs. Toro. Uh, gave to us was how the treatment of animals in zoos, not only in America, but mostly in predominantly Spanish-speaking countries, South America, Spain. Mm -hmm. And that really just sort of, even though something I might look over in a Boston Globe or in a Herald, it's something that really was brought to my attention and I really sort of felt passionate for to write about. So I wrote about a some zoos in Argentina, some zoos in Chile, and how mm -hmm. the specifics of how they were being, how they were treating the animals and then I wrote about how in America and also in Latin, uh, Latin American countries, uh, how they treated the animals well. So there are, there's a positive and a negative to both sides, but I hinted on the negative side. Great job, you're, you're a good sport. You handled that well. <laughs> <laughs> any, other, any other questions? <laughs> I, I just have to applaud Ms. Toro because you cannot cross the door, the door front, how do you say it? La puerta, whatever. 
you must speak Spanish. And I go in there, and it's there without class has not started, and they're chatting away in Spanish, and it's really impressive. And the curriculum is just outstanding. So that's great. So you're at Spanish four this year, <laughs> and next year what happens? AP Spanish is uh, it? Yeah, I plan to take AP. Too. Good for you. Good for you. Yeah, great. Great job, everyone. Oh, do you have a question? Thank you. There's another one of these student reps who are going to end up running for school committee, running for state rep. And, uh, <laughs> good. Yeah. We need you. We need you. Run. Run. Thank you very much. Great job, you. as always. Thank you guys. You guys, great job. Perfect. All right, we're going to hear about uh, national criminal background checks, fingerprinting. This is a very uplifting topic. Rob, go ahead. <laughs> sorry, to, um, sorry to bring the room down a little after, uh, after Spanish all and this world history <laughs> excitement. And, and, yes. Yeah. But we um, obviously have to comply with uh, the new state law that was uh, enacted last year. Mm -hmm. And um, regulations uh, were issued. It was signed into the law in January of 2013. And the, State spent many months um, <clears throat> drafting regulations and deciding how they're going to implement the law, and we're sort of now beginning the implementation. We've begun the implementation over the last f couple months. So obviously, we've had Cory checks for years. Cory checks cover Massachusetts, so we can see when someone comes in, we can check their Cory and see if they have had any criminal arrests or convictions in Massachusetts. This law now aligns Massachusetts with the rest of the country, which does national criminal background checks. It's a sort of two-pronged uh, fingerprint check that taps into both the state uh, criminal database and the FBI database, and we can get reports um, from those databases, with, usually within 72 hours of, uh, of the fingerprints being taken. Um, and so again, we're aligned with the rest of the nation. So now fingerprinting has started. Right now it's new employees who were hired, have been hired since July 1, 2013. This includes any full or part-time employee who may have unmonitored, direct and unmonitored contact with children, any substitute employee that includes, any student teacher, apprentice, or intern, and any individual who regularly provides school-related transportation to children. We're in the implementation timeline now. Um, for the past few months, there's been a lot of on the, the message boards for the uh, HR administrators for the school districts in Massachusetts. There's been a lot of discussion about fingerprinting and how it's going and you know, how we're, how we're um, implementing it. Mm -hmm. So as I said, any newly hired employees since July 1, 2013 are supposed to be fingerprinted by the end of this current school year. Mm -hmm. Prior to anyone who was hired before that, who has been working for the district for years or any time before July 1, 2013, after this round of fingerprinting is, is done, basically, for all the new employees, the state is going to set an implementation timetable between 2014 and 2016 to get all of those employees, um, all of those employees uh, f fingerprinted. And so we'll know more probably over the summer um, what that timeline is going to look like and how we're going to implement that part of it. For any new employees who are starting next year, um, we're, going to imp we're going to be fingerprinting them upon making them an offer of employment along with doing the Cori check. So how are fingerprints collected? So the state has um, developed this application, Applicant Fingerprint Identification Services SAFIS program. The state is contracted with a vendor, Morpho Trust, which operates under Identigo. They have um, different locations where you have to go to get fingerprinted. This is not a, an area where you can go, just go to the police station and get fingerprinted. The state is not accepting that. It's not allowing that. It's only through this contracted vendor, which currently has 11 locations in Massachusetts. They're expanding slowly. Um, probably over the next couple months, they'll add several more. Um, there will eventually be 33 enrollment centers. Um, applicants and employees, they schedule their, their appointments over the phone or online. All fingerprints, again, take place at one of the enrollment centers. However, they are request accepting requests for on-site processing. So if you have a significant number of employees who need to be fingerprinted, based on their availability of having staff and equipment available and scheduling, they will make an appointment to come to your location. 
I am happy to announce that we have been able to have them come to set up at least one date right now for next Wednesday. They're coming to Arlington High School. They're going to be um, set up shop in the conference room next to my office and do the fingerprinting for our employees who, have, who were hired since July 1 of last year. And then everyone needs to show identification when they appear for fingerprinting. And there is a fee. It's $35 or $55. It's $55 for licensed educators. Anyone who has a DESE license pays the higher cost. And every, the fingerprints are electronic. There's no ink. It's a, an electronic read. Um, and then once the fingerprints are collected, they're transmitted to the state police and the FBI for their searches. They're returned electronically to then the Department of Criminal Justice, which has to redact anything that's been sealed or juvenile records that have show up, because we won't see those. And then again, within 72 hours, we get the results. Um, every district has a point of contact. It's designated to receive the results. In most districts, it's the HR administrator, and that's the case here. I'm the point of contact here. And then once we get the results, what we're charged with doing is making a suitability determination. It's similar to what we do with quarry results. I mean, if we get a quarry result and we find that based on a quarry, someone isn't suitable to, um, to work in the Arlington Public Schools, we will exclude them based on, on that and follow the process required mm -hmm. under the quarry law. Um, similar thing, we will have to make a suitable, suitability determination for everyone who, every result we receive, whether they're suitable or not suitable. How have we communicated this to employees? So at, we, I've been emailing employees. All employees have received an email about the law and about the fingerprinting requirements. All new employees have had more detailed information several times to inform them about the process they need to do to undertake uh, to do, get the fingerprints done. Uh, we sent another email today with very detailed instructions on how they need to register to um, enroll online to have their fingerprints taken here in Arlington next week. There's a special, it's called a special site scheduling and they've, they've done it that way. So um, we, uh, Kelly Piggott and Maria Lalicata in our office um, created very detailed instructions uh, on how to do that. District policy. One of the requirements in the regs is that all school employers, the school committee here is the, is the employer, um, must adopt a policy, and DESE has created a model policy which I distributed in your packets. Um, right now, it's not exactly clear what the deadline is for the policy. I've sort of threw it out there on uh, the listserv for the other HR directors what they're doing. Some of them are creating the policies now. Their school committees are voting now. Others are waiting until the fall. Others um, sort of uh, just getting started with taking up the policy. I think we just have to have a policy. I think if we have a policy in place by the beginning of the next school year, we'll be okay. But I think we should get the process started, and that's why I did put the model policy in the packet. There are resources available um, that uh, just sort of, uh, there's a frequently asked questions section on DESE's website. Um, there's the regs, I, I, are a resource. And then I can show you if I can so I'm just linking to what we see. When you go onto the Identigo website um, for Massachusetts, this is a national company that does this kind of fingerprint background checks in multiple states across the, the country. And so they have a specific Massachusetts site. When you click on that site, you can see um, you know, towards the bottom of that page, online scheduling, that's where you click and go through the, enroll, the scheduling process where you have to put in your district code. We've provided the district code for all employees. Um, you pay online, you can do a credit card payment. They will accept a check or money order at, um, at the time of the appointment, but they cannot accept cash. Um, and it lists the locations that are currently um, available and uh, they will add the locations that, you know, to that list once they're, um, once they're there. So that's about 
I think we're mm -hmm. towards the end. If there's any questions about this, I can be happy to take them. Cindy. Um, so the only cost is what individual teachers have to pay? Yes, according to the regulations, the cost is borne by the employee. Um, this is what the state is, has said is that's the way it is in most other states, that it is kind of like it's a cost of becoming an employee for a school district. So either $35 or $50, $55 they would have to pay. So there's no additional cost for us to access the information, for us to get the information. We don't pay We don't pay to get all. the information. Okay. No. They send the um, results via secure email. Mm -hmm. So I had to register and, and put, um, I have a, it's password protected and it's a secured encrypted email, I guess, that I get. And I can then, once I put in my password, I can view the results. So for those who um, so I understand that they're kind of, um, you know, starting with the newer people. Is there any reason why all teachers shouldn't just go and get it done whenever they can? Well, one of the reasons is that we, the priority based on the, the law and the regulations is to get the new people done first. And if you think about this, the statewide, anyone who was hired by a school district since July 1, 2013 until now, and this system has really just recently been fully, it's not even fully implemented yet because every location is not open yet, and there's different, uh, um, there's just, you know, a handful, I mean, 11 now uh, locations and in different parts all over the state. So right now, I mean, I had to get fingerprinted because I'm going to be looking at the fingerprinting results. So anyone who's doing that needs to get fingerprinted. Mm -hmm. I went to Dorchester to get fingerprinted, which is, I think, right near Jeff's school probably. <laughs> um, and that was sort of the, one of the closest places to here at the time. They've since, they've added Framingham. There's a Tewksbury location. Uh, I think um, there's a few other. There might be one in Lowell, uh, uh, or there will be. Um, there's, uh, and there's just all over the place. I think there will be one in Watertown and um, within the next month or so, I think. But I'm not sure exactly when they're opening. One of the reasons uh, it's taken a long time to open is that this is a private vendor that is setting up space. And they have to do leases and that kind of stuff. So. The okay, challenge. Thanks, that's it. Would the school committee have to decide whether or not to charge volunteers who are giving their time for nothing anyway? So volunteers are not required to be fingerprinted. That would be something that we would decide, the school committee would decide based on the policy whether you would want volunteers to be fingerprinted, but it is not a requirement of the law. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm thinking about what you were saying about how the results come in and wondering is our, are our servers secure enough to be getting stuff like this? I'm not saying you know the answer to this. This is more. It, I, it's, it's really it's just an email with an attached, there's an attached message. I have to log, I just have to put a password in to get the attachment because um, I'm already, I'm registered as. A, right, a, but I mean, it's coming through the email. It's not like a link that you go download it from. It's a link. Well, it is a link, but it's, I mean, it, there's an email that I get to, but it's, uh, there's. It's an email with a link. And okay. Put the oh, so it's not the, the document in. It's not, right. Okay, the okay, that's, that's where I was getting a little worried. No, because I don't think we have that kind of secure. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, okay. Uh, here's a technical question that if, uh, let's say, you have a new teacher in another district. Yes. And they get fingerprinted this year in their old district. And we go and raid the neighboring district and hire a really great teacher away from them. Uh, do, the, uh, do, do the fingerprints follow them at that point, or do they have to do this all over again? So the fingerprints don't follow you. you I, I can't share, from my perspective, I couldn't share the fingerprint results mm -hmm. with another district. What I can share is our suitability determination. Mm -hmm. I can tell another HR director that yes, we found this person suitable to work in Arlington. Mm -hmm. And they have the choice to rely on that suitability determination or not. Mm -hmm. I think under the regs, if they decide they don't want to rely on the suitability determination and make the person get fingerprinted again, then it's up to the district to pay the cost mm -hmm. in that case. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's good. All right. Oh, I think we're yeah, go ahead, Nikki. You have a question? Uh, would this law and system of identification take into account the after school and like perhaps private programs that are through schools? 
So. You would, you would. And so, so in Arlington, as many of you know, we have after school programs that are both, we have a couple at, at Thompson and, and Hardy that are our district employees work at those schools. We will be fingerprinting them as, as our employees. The other elementary schools have, um, and, and Audison have um, private contractors that use our space. And those private contractors have to, those, those, they're the employers of those, of those people who work there, and they have to do the fingerprinting. Yeah. Well, I move we refer this to policies and procedures. We have a motion to move this to policies and procedures. Second. There's a second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Okay, so it's in the hands of policies and procedures. All right, we go to a discussion on the Arlington Public Schools 2014-2015 calendar with Dr. Chesson. Well, actually, Dr. Bode. yes, Dr. Bode. Oh. Mr. Hainer would very much like to be part of this discussion. Oh, he would. He would, um, because of because of the school committee dates. Um, let me just quickly frame this, but maybe we could put well, table let's just, this. Let's just table, oh, we just table. table this until he let's gets. Let's table there. until he gets here. So, Paul, you want to make the right motion? You know how to do that. Uh, motion to table the discussion of the. Arlington Public Schools 2014-2015 uh, school calendar. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, it's tabled. So let's get the monthly report from Diane Johnson. Hi, good evening. Um, since our last monthly meeting, town meeting has begun, and at the special town meeting, um, a vote was passed to return the $500,000 we set into a stabilization account to help defray our special education overage for this year and also to compensate us for the damage that happened at the Pierce due to a boiler failure and a subsequent pipe freezing and bursting. Um, so we're very grateful for those votes and glad to be moving forward. The situation is pretty much the same as the last time I reported. Special Ed continues to run at about the same level of overage. And we have closed out our spending for the year. We are coming to the last place, but we're having, we're having some struggles with the heating bills coming in because the heating season extended a little longer than usual. March was un unusually cold, and we were still running full, full bore on the gas furnaces through the end of March. And so the, the, the bills tend to run a monthish behind. So I want to get that all in place before I see the final energy. Um, I'm hoping that we will be able to pick up some ground against the special ed overage with some available balance in the general fund. But this is a tough year for energy. We were able to close out an expensive litigation and um, special ed had a tough year. So the usual places where we might pick up savings, all you know, it was a perfect storm. Nevertheless, we do have sufficient balances in our reserves. My hope is, however, that we might pick up some ground and not have to drain our reserves as thoroughly and still retain some for future. So I'll have a better picture of that. Actually, I won't, have, I won't be here at the beginning of June. I'll be at my 25th college reunion. I'd hope to introduce to you from my office, Harold uh, Ansaw will be here in my place, but he is ill today, unfortunately, and couldn't be here. But he will be here in, in June in my place, and I'm sure will do his usual excellent job. Jersey. When you talk about draining the reserves and the need to do this, is that including the special ed circuit breaker reserve or is that still? Okay, no, so no I'm good. holding okay. that. I really oh, consider yeah. Oh, yeah. one of the strengths of our budget that we have a solid lock on our circuit breaker yep. money every year because that's a highly flexible amount, yep. very hard to lock down. Yep. And so that would be absolutely the last place I would go. Now, if we, if we were to have a dire year, God forbid, next year, two bad years in a row, that does provide us a cushion, but I, I really think we are so advantaged by knowing exactly how much circuit breaker we have at the beginning of the budget process, rather than making guesses and holding our breath all through the summer. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Any other questions about the budget? In Spanish or English? Doesn't matter. <laughs> no hablo espanol. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Diane. Superintendent's yeah. report. Thank you, Mr. Thielman. Well, first of all, I want to congratulate Mr. Thielman for wow. making it to the front page of the Globe today Thank you. for his school, Crystal Ray. It's very impressive. 
very impressive achievement that you have 100% of your students accepted into four-year colleges. Thank you very much. Good team. I have a good team to work with. Though. Mm -hmm. huh. It sounds like a very good team. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, we have a, I have a, actually quite a few things to, uh, and, and I, I'm always concerned, did I miss something really important? But the first thing I, I wanted to bring your attention to, which I know that you're aware of, um, and I guess I take every opportunity I can to sort of talk about the distinction of the, for the high school recently in U.S. News and World Report mm -hmm. having a gold award distinction. And it's, it's, um, it's something I think that certainly the high school is very proud about as well as the whole district because you don't have students prepared for doing well on standardized tests or rigorous courses mm -hmm. just beginning in high school. Although, as you can see, I think you get a little bit of a window t tonight into really some of the courses and the expectations and rigor of our, of our high school. But the, the, uh, there are several metrics that were used, which I, which I think people don't, may not completely understand, that it's not just simply results in MCAS, but it's also the results of performance of our students in subgroups, as well as um, the AP exam results. And as you know, this is the fourth year the Arlington High School is on the College Board honor roll for not only expanding the number of students taking AP courses, but maintaining um, a fairly high percentage. In fact, the College Board put 75% as the standard. We're in the, in the mid-80s. Uh, it varies a little bit within a year, but we're in the 80% in terms of the number of students who take AP exams and score a three or better. And a three or better, three, four, or five, allows you in college in some places to have credit, but more often these days it allows you to, to, to skip prerequisite courses, which for some students might mean that they could um, have one less semester of tuition. Uh, that's, a, that's a possibility. So our students are doing very well on those, and the, uh, the ranking for the high school is 21st amongst the 75 high schools in Massachusetts that were ranked. There are actually 352 high schools. So they did very well, and nationally the ranking was 465 out of 31,242 schools. So it's, it's, it's a high school is doing very well, and I think our students should be very proud of themselves for their hard work and certainly our staff as well uh, throughout the entire district. So congratulations. I'm sure you're part of the success story here. And I think if they're measuring Spanish as part of this, we'd even do better, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> He's good. All right. Um, this week we had a wonderful event at the high school. In fact, I'll, I'll ask Laura to talk a little bit more about it. And give, I, I also wanted to say I give her a lot of credit for the wonderful exhibition of technology of, of exciting things that are happening in the, all of our schools. And I know thank you to many of you that were here that evening. Um, this was co-sponsored with the Arlington Educational Foundation, which has been so supportive of helping us expand the ways that we, uh, our technology hardware as well as um, opportunities for, in this case, to showcase it. But more importantly, they were the group that provided the, the STEM lab here at the high school, which is used all the time. And um, Laura was uh, in instrumental in this and also in helping us um, develop the next iteration of our technology plan. The, the technology plan is something that's just an ongoing um, a plan that, that gets updated all the time. But I, I would like you to have a couple minutes to talk about it and all the students and the ages of, of the kids that uh, uh, participated. Um, first of all, I have to say that um, while I may have uh, lit the spark, there, were, uh, there was a team of three people that really carried it to fruition, actually four people, Susan Bisson um, and Francis DeBera and Jeff Snyder, all from our tech department, and then Stacy Kitsis, who's our library, me library media specialist, really helped to carry off the night. 
Uh, we had 28 teachers present, um, and most excitingly, with their students. Uh, we had teachers uh, and students from grade one all the way up through high school. Um, the grade one students presented Scratch Junior, which is our programming uh, partnership with the Tufts Media Lab. And um, we, they also presented at the Tech Forum last week. And uh, people could not believe that the level of programming that were being done by first grade students. And uh, we had people from every discipline, foreign language, the humanities, math, science. Um, we even had a gentleman who was coming in um, and uh, showing us what we might even use in the future, which is virtual reality um, glasses and, and a virtual real reality system. So uh, it, it was quite an exciting night. The, uh, the place was packed. Um, the ex level of excitement was palpable, and um, I just can't say enough about the teachers and their students. I think the students really helped make it. I noticed that the, the presenters who had students with them were far more well attended um, than the ones that just had teachers, which means that our students are far more interesting than we are as adults. And uh, I just can't say enough about it. The last thing I want to say is that not only did AEF help us with the cost of the hardware, but they made a sizable grant last summer to help us with a tech university. Um, which allowed us to uh, train somewhere in the neighborhood of 250 teachers, anywhere from one day to uh, five days. And in addition, they helped us to sponsor T21, which was a year-long graduate-level course in the introduction of technology and the utilization of technology to better meet the needs of all students. And it was so successful that we'll actually be running a similar class, but funded by the district uh, for this summer, particularly for teachers at the high school level and uh, really trying to expand in the high school what we've started in the middle school and the elementary school. Thank you. And one of our presenters at night is Siobhan Foley, who is here. I don't know, Siobhan, put you on the spot a little bit. Do you want to talk a little bit about yours? Well, I don't have to do in Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> French. <laughs> Siobhan is fluent in Spanish. <laughs>
would show how they did progress. And so when their parents came in to see what they had done, it, they could also show them all the work they had done prior to that as opposed to just seeing the final outcome. And if it didn't work, you know, you, you have tears in the classroom. Well, this time the kids could show them, no, really, it did work. I have a video of it working. It just didn't work right now. So, um, you know, I, th I just think it was uh, having the, te the iPads in the classroom um, can be a really fantastic experience. So it was great to be able to show to share that and, you know, to have those conversations with people to showcase what we're doing here in Arlington. Mm -hmm. And I was amazed at what they're doing in some of the other schools. I wish I could have been able to walk around myself mm -hmm. and see more of that. But mm -hmm. what I did see in the presentation was, you know, blew me away. The, what mm -hmm. the, they're doing at the Odyssey was just fantastic. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's true. And it, so thank, thank you, Siobhan. It really was, it was interesting. I got to most, but not to everything. It, it is um, very impressive. Where we have come in the last few years is uh, amazing. And I, you know, we look a year from now and even two years from now, uh, it's going to be even more transformative in terms of what we're doing in education. And I think that one thing that is, was really clear from all the presentations. It's not technology for technology's sake. None of us want to do that. It's about how does technology enhance uh, what we're doing and actually make it better. And I think your example is a great example on that one. So thank you. And as, as we, you heard earlier, we had a couple groups go to the technology conference Ed Tech Conference last week and be presenters, which, you know, that's a great experience for our, our children to be in that kind of a role in a conference, in a room with people asking them questions, just like you would do as an adult presenter. It's terrific. Um, a whole bunch of other things. Uh, kindergarten enrollment. We are just, we're growing uh, a lot. We're at 495 students right now. And uh, we still have more registrations coming in next week. So we we had done, as per policy, made all the assignments through the um, the buffer zone policy, looking, making sure that everything was very equitable. And that was only a couple of weeks ago. It is slowly, not slowly, quickly becoming unequitable. So it may actually be that we'll have to, I'll have to go, and and do some. Uh, movement off the wait list again and some shifting because the goal is really to uh, keep this as equitable as possible but we're also ex looking at next year with a, a constraint while we increased our number of reserve positions to five we're there we're, we're at five mm -hmm. and there's still some other <coughs> needs going on right now so we're looking at ways that we might be able to uh, figure this out. So I'll give you more of a report on that as we go along. But we're seeing significant increases and one of the one of the increases that we're anticipating is needing to have uh, additional ELL teachers. And I think at one of our next uh, school committee meetings we'll we'll talk a little bit more about that. We're still right now trying to figure figure this out how we're going to to staff to the needs we have. Um, there are a number of congratulations too. Um, Mr. Hainer's not here, but we uh, we did get, see pictures in the um, Advocate, and I know the Lexington's paper had pictures of um, the Special Olympics. That was great, and we had uh, we have buddies that go, and we had some of our students go and par participate with um, their buddy and help them f through the Olympics. And congratulations to all of them. Those of you that heard the Pops concert this weekend, it was outstanding as it, it just only seems to get better and better and the comments, people uh, leaving these concerts are just amazed. In fact, um, we were at the Cherry Blossom just with, for our, our visit and a, a couple of you were here, the, that, the orchestra that was grades three, four, and five. What, weren't they amazing? Yeah. And of course, we had our middle school orchestra win an award and having the judges being shocked that they were a middle school orchestra. So um, the, our music program is terrific and, and congratulations to all of them. Uh, we also have some um, oppressive results also in the art world. 
we have um, two students who have been recognized. One, uh, Julie Foran, for the Scholastic Arts Award. This is probably the most prestigious recognition program in art for um, students in the United States. And Julie is a sophomore, and she received the highest regional scholastic award of a gold key. And uh, when she went to the national level, she received a silver medal, and she will attend the national ceremony at Carnegie Hall in New York in June. We also have a, an Art Allstate Award with Hadley Flavin, and she, um, this is the 27th Massachusetts Art Allstate, and it, this, um, this past, uh, this coming, I should say, in the end of May at the Worcester Art Museum. And the most talented juniors from across the state come for this intensive two-day art experience, but you have to be selected based on your artwork. Artwork. So congratulations to both of them. We also had one of our nurses. This was, na this was National Teachers Week, and Tuesday was National Teachers Day, and also Wednesday was National Nurses Day. And Martha Bennis, who is a uh, the nurse up at Stratton, was had was um, was uh, uh, congratulated in the Boston Globe for the work that she does up there, the, the many hats, the kindness that, that she wears, and the many, and the acts of kindness she's, she always um, is known for. So congratulations to Martha. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about the Leslie interns? Because this is a, a, something that's going to be sure. terrific for next year. Um, we have established a, a partnership with Leslie that we will be taking three interns next year who will be getting dual certified in both elementary education and ELL. Um, so they will not only, is, it's a win-win for both Leslie and for the district uh, because we'll get some additional hands to help out with our ELL students and we'll also um, be able to provide them with a training ground. So we'll be matching them up with both a general education classroom teacher and an ELL teacher. We'll be placing one student at Hardy, one at Brackett, and one at Thompson, and we made those decisions based on the number of ELL students at those um, schools. Uh, this program has been running in Somerville for quite some time. Uh, the students go to school all summer, and actually at the end of the summer, we'll have already taken 12 graduate credits, and we'll have already passed their MTEL exams. So they come to us quite prepared to um, contribute to the school system. Over time, uh, we hope to expand this program, and Leslie is talking about offering some of their graduate uh, courses for these students right here within Arlington. So it would be quite advantageous um, for the students that are accepted to this program. It's a, a pretty extensive uh, application process, and we have three interns that are coming on board. Uh, one actually has experience uh, working in the Peace Corps, teaching English in South America. One of the um, interns uh, has currently been an aide for two years in special education in another district. And uh, the third person has been teaching after school programs and weekend programs for students. So this, they will not be as green as green can be, certainly not certified teachers yet, but they ha all have experience that they can bring to the table to share with our schools. It's, it's nice that we are being considered a site. A lot of, school, a lot of schools more increasingly want to have sites that they send that their um, interns or their student teachers to, and it's nice that Arlington has been recognized as um, a good place to send students. And then one other award, this was the other night at the Boys and Girls Club, um, our own Cindy Sheridan Curran received the Boys and Girls uh, Faulkner Award, and this is for great service to the community, and many of you know that she was one of the, the um, the prime movers of having the diversion program. She ran the diversion program and still runs the diver diversion program, uh, while at the same time working in our the public the Arlington Public Schools as our attendance officer. Um, she also, for the last I think seven years, has been the president of the of the hockey association in town. So she has been very busy and 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 was a very well deserved honor and and her acceptance. Um, speech was, was, was quite well done. So congratulations to Cindy. And um, that's all I have this evening. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for Dr. Bodie? Okay. <clears throat>
We'll move on to the consent oh, agenda. I'm sorry. Oh, you do. I'm I didn't sorry. have a question. Yeah, no, I forgot. Um, you were saying that are you going to talk more about that we need another ELL teacher next year? Is that because of the state regs change? Um, it's be well, it's not that they've changed. They have changed a little bit. Can but yes, we, we need to be able to provide a certain number of hours um, of direct service, pull out service to students that are designated as a level one or level two student. Basically mm -hmm. level one is they're coming in with no language skills at all. And we do have a fair number of students and we just even recently received um, a couple of students that have no English skills. And uh, it's, it's, but they're all in different places. And so I think the challenge is going to be to, to figure out how we can um, provide that level of intervention in the locations that the students are. Okay. I was just highlighting it because it's another one of the things that we're having to do that we're not getting extra money. Oh, the that, mandates, yes. yes. That's yeah. It most certainly is. Consent agenda. All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. So on the consent agenda, we have approval of warrant uh, number 14148 dated April 10th, 2014 in the amount of $522,077.97. Approval of warrant 14154 dated April 24th, 2014 in the amount of $545,926.85. Uh, approval of draft minutes uh, of the Organizational and Regular School Committee meeting on April 10th, 2014 and approval, and approval of the AHS World Language France exchange trip and, uh, during the April vacation. Mr. Hainer is here. Can I have a motion? So moved. Yeah, second. second. All second. in favor say aye. 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 Thank you very much. The chair is back. You can continue. No. Okay. Well, it, uh, we're we kind of we're, we're going to go right to the calendar in a minute. Let's just okay. finish the subcommittees. Mm -hmm. Any subcommittee reports, policies, and procedures? It looks like we have a policy to start working on. We have yeah. There is. Schedule a meeting soon. And we should talk to um, the attorney. Yeah. Attorney Brian. The attorney Brian. Yeah. Budget, Cindy. Yeah. Uh, we had a meeting yesterday um, with uh, some members from FinCom. Um, who uh, the goal uh, for me having these meetings uh, was that I think that um, every year we go through this uh, process where we have to meet with FinCom and it felt like if we could get ahead of time or ahead of it kind of asking them what would make the process easier for us, what makes it easier for them to understand. It's a huge budget. It's a lot for people to get through. Um, and so I think it was really good. It was kind of back and forth. I think we got some good ideas for kind of how to move forward. Um, so I thought it was a good meeting. Um, so that was great. I also wanted to say that uh, I was uh, excited. There were five of us who went to the Day on the Hill. Um, so it was um, Jennifer, myself, Kiersey, Paul, and uh, Bill were up there um, beaten up on uh, Dave and Sean who were in the midst of running to the floor to vote and then coming back and meeting with us, which was great. So it was right in the middle of budget, which was excellent. Um, so it was kind of good they were there. Um, and also we had a chance to meet with uh, Senator Donnelly um, and really help him understand what it was we were seeing, where he could help. Um, I have since been in contact uh, back with his office. Uh, his office has decided to focus on amendments to the METCO funding um, and really helping hone in on how we can help make that better. Um, and so we have, I have sent him the information that we had on um, kind of what the cost is, the differential. I told him that my focus was at least to try to get uh, cities and towns who take METCO students to get Chapter 70 money that would be Boston level Chapter 70 money versus Arlington or wherever town they're going um, because the students that come often do come with more uh, needs for interventions um, and so to really help us kind of cover those costs. So um, I'm working with uh, 
an aide in his office and we're kind of trying to pen that up. So it's, it was also good because I feel like for the first time I understand the process that it, you know, it always starts with the governor's budget and I've always known that. Then it goes to the House and then the Senate tries to amend stuff and tries to then massage it into something that everybody can live with. And so um, understanding that we had a couple of weeks now, now that the House was actually past their version of it, um, that we can now we have a couple of weeks to help um, make up, help our senators come up with the ideas they want to take, and then they take one or two ideas and try to champion them and, and amend the budget according to that. So um, it's been kind of interesting as a process. So I was really glad it was a, it was a great, uh, I thought it was a great meeting. We had some, some good topics. Did you want to talk about your chief? Oh, yeah, and uh, one of the things that we had done as a budget uh, subcommittee, and I, I had them included in everybody's packet, is that we had a budget meeting, so before yesterday, we had a budget meeting about a week ago, um, and just sat down with the superintendent and with uh, Ms. Johnson and tried to come up with actual costs for um, if we had the money we need to, or all the costs of the things that we should implement that are unfunded mandates to get us to um, covering the new teacher evaluation system, we, we picked only these four, uh, the common core curriculum, uh, the new ELL retail requirements, and increased reporting mandates that have uh, become fairly standard for districts. And we just tried to say, okay, if we were to staff and do everything according to the way we read these mandates, how much additional money should we put in our budget for this year to be able to do that so that they could understand? Because I think that people don't necessarily understand what it, what it means to say that it's gonna cost more if you don't, well, how much more? Is it $5 more, is it $50 more, is it, turns out it's $5 million more. So um, mm -hmm. I thought that was really good. We tried to explain that to them. We also explained a lot of um, the different levels of students that we're seeing, health issues, um, you know, the fact that nursing and a lot of healthcare um, mm -hmm. is still, we are having to bear the burden of those costs um, and just that the, we're getting very different students and, and the concerns and issues that they're bringing into our schools are very different and that those costs um, are also just a burden. So I think it was just really good. I think, you know, it's really hard. I've realized more and more that we, we are in an awkward position. We get all of our regulations and told what to do by the Department of Education, which gives us no money to do anything, mm -hmm. and we get the money from the state, and the two don't seem to talk very much, and mm -hmm. so trying to be the go-between, I feel like really, if we think about it, we are the only thing that those have in common, is that our district is reliant on somebody being the person who's understanding that, and explaining to our legislators mm -hmm. what's going on because they don't necessarily know what Desi's telling us that we have to do or what those costs are. And so to help them understand that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I, I thought it was great. I always love it. I, I was excited that we had so many people there. And um, I don't know if anyone else who I, went, wanted to Jennifer, say you want to say something? Oh, I, I just wanted to say that, um, that they were very sympathetic, that Ken Donnelly, mm -hmm. that um, uh, Sean Garbali and um, Dave Rogers um, want to help us and that uh, if we can find especially small things that aren't just a increase in Chapter 70 funding, which everybody wants, right? If we can find some small things that are unique to Arlington, they are willing to go to that for us. And so just to keep that in mind as we sort of look in the coming years. Great. Kirsty, you want to? I just thought it was really helpful having a bottom line number mm -hmm. of this mm -hmm. is yeah. what these things are costing us. It just, it, it, I think it opened their eyes. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't think they had realized that before and it just it gave them something to think about um, and I think it prepares mm -hmm. for further discussions you know but it, they're going to be thinking about this for a while great so. job Paul uh, the thing is is that uh, if uh, the Arlington delegation or in the legislature uh, the whole state be in a lot better shape uh, <laughs> our folks have been very responsive uh, it was such a pleasure talking to our two reps and our senator um, <clears throat> the thing is, is that as we lobby, we have to be careful that we're lobbying for things that don't put us in a conflict or a zero-sum game for others. So that 
you know, things like changing the Chapter 70 formula to advantage Arlington would just mean redistributing the pie and the people who'd be losing, and that uh, tweak of the formula would be then uh, uh, looking to work against us, so that what we have to do is work cooperatively with MASC uh, to find things that the legislature is willing to do and that will be advantaged to us and other uh, communities. The other thing is, is that uh, in, in the current setup, the State Board of Elementary and Secondary Education has been left with a lot of discretion to do things to us. And the more we can talk to our legislators about uh, having some oversight on the actions of DESE uh, legislatively w would be a good thing. For example, one of the things we talked about is the commissioner has decided that he wants to cap and reduce out of district uh, tuitions to vocational schools, which will not directly help or hurt the school committee, but it will hurt this town because the revenues that don't come in out of district revenue need to be filled by local revenue when we're right now producing 38 percent of the local revenue to the school. So uh, lot, lots of things to talk about in, in, uh, in a very, very proactive uh, uh, group of legislators who want to do the right thing for us. Great. Just to go along with what Cindy said about making that connection between DESE and uh, us regarding the Metco, I think I saw, I, I won't speak for the whole group, but uh, surprise in our delegation's eyes when we indicated they come up with a Metco budget, that doesn't all get spent necessarily because they're planning on Chapter 70 funding for the city of Boston for all the students and stuff or from the prior year. Our Chapter 70 uh, piece is smaller than the city of Boston. And they, I felt very responsible, especially Senator Donnelly, to look at this very carefully, that the money that is budgeted, all we're asking for is an equitable share of that piece to help us along. Great. Uh, community relations? Any oh, other uh, yeah, no report except <laughs> that uh, um, I, I was looking for Ms. Hyam. <laughs> 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 Hey Lee, but we, we, we love you, we miss you. Um, uh, the, uh, however, we had some really great community relations last night because the uh, Magical Singers did a wonderful, stellar, crisp, beautiful job in front of town meeting uh, yesterday in their rendition of the Star Spangled Banner. Uh, I'm sure it's in the video file for ACMI. Uh, we should make sure the Red Sox and the Bruins see that. Be good. Curriculum instruction. Oh, oh yeah, I'm sorry. As part of community relations, I'm on the subcommittee. Uh -huh. I think with you. Um, there, I just want to make one plug. Saturday morning, nine to twelve. There's Arlington cleanup, uh -huh. um, which is going to take place starting at the municipal parking lot, and people can um, pick up. I think Kiersey was a part of that. I think I saw you there last year. Um, pick up uh, some garbage bags. Go around. It, it, it's great for the kids to get involved with the parents and uh, to do significant cleanup. There was a lot done in three hours last, last year, which was the first year. So uh, 9 to 12, there'll be muffins and coffee and, and beverages and stuff provided. So please come on down if you, if you have some time free on Saturday morning. Terrific. And they meet where? Where do they meet, Judd? The municipal yep. parking lot. OK. So we yep. know where you'll be on Saturday. Yeah, that's right. I, yeah, I will be here. There'll be others from the Pierce family cleaning up. I'll be cleaning up here. Curriculum instruction assessment accountability. Nothing to report. I have nothing to report for facilities. Special study group on superintendent's evaluation. I had asked uh, Mr. Schlickman to talk about that. Or I oh, okay. Uh, basically, we just had a preliminary discussion on, on this. Uh, we are talking about maintaining the November uh, evaluation cycle, uh, which uh, really seems is critically important in terms of evaluating the superintendent as some of the measures that we use are uh, state measures that don't get released to us till September. So uh, that's where we're at. This discussion will be continued. If I just might add, and correct me if I again misunderstood it, but we're going to be working on the district goals mm -hmm. this coming Saturday mm -hmm. at our meeting and from that making sure yes. they're aligned with mm -hmm. the superintendent's goals. Mm -hmm. which they. Probably, yeah. Later, yeah. Yes. Later. It's a multi-step process. Right. 
Thank you. Yes. All right, so it's 8.35. We're right on time for the discussion on Arlington Public Schools 2014-2015 school calendar. We do, I, we just, do you want a motion? Or oh, I, I move we take the uh, school calendar off the table. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, we're back at it. Thank the you. chair is here. Okay. Right. I frame it? Go for it. Okay. We've had a two-step process um, for developing the calendar for next year. We've already had a, a vote a couple months ago with the start date, school vacations, uh, the professional day, some of the major, uh, major pieces of the calendar, which is what parents want to know. When, when should we be back from vacation? And that has been done. But now, w one of the goals that we have had uh, for the last couple of years is trying to put everything in the calendar. For a while there, we were not putting the co conferences on until the fall, or we did have the, the early release days, but um, we want to have a, completely, a complete calendar be at the end of the school year so people have an idea of when early releases are, when conferences are, and that is our goal. So tonight, um, there is a discussion in a couple of areas that we want your feedback for at, with the goal that next meeting we will come to you for first read with the calendar and see if there's anything further and then have a, a final vote on the school calendar for next year at the June meeting. So that's the timeline. So there's three areas, and one area has to do with actually the school committee dates. And now I'm going to turn this over to the chair. Thank you. Um, if you look at the calendar, the months of September, November, December, and April, because of holidays and different things, we would on our current calendar of the second and fourth Thursday of the month would only have one meeting. Um, I would like you to consider uh, potentially two options. One, for at least three of those months, September, November, and December, and I'll talk to those, moving it to the first and third Thursday of the month, or to the second option, suspend the policy for, uh, that has those uh, the third and fourth, excuse me, the second and fourth Thursday, to try a first and third for the entire year. Two options to consider. The reason uh, I'm mentioning September is that we're coming off the summer. I realize it's the first week of school where everybody, is, especially you as parents uh, that are sitting on the committee, it's that fairly hectic time. But we may have a lot of things going. Um, definitely November and December, that's budget. We have a lot of people coming to us uh, for presentations and stuff. And, very, and we also have the superintendent's evaluation that is in there that sometimes we even add a third one during that time. If we're down to one during November and one in December, I think we're really be way behind. So what I'd like you to consider, at least for September, November, and December, to go to the first and third. And the second option, and by the way, these options, uh, Karen and I, and I think Dr. Bordy, we look to add on the town websites for the different committees and things, we didn't see any conflict. Now, some of you may have something that is not posted on here that we're unaware of. That's why we're having this discussion like that. So I'll open it up for anyone that like I'm a star. So um, I actually have a third possibility, uh -huh. um, which would be um, suspend the policy for the year and have policies and procedures draft up a change. Mm -hmm. And I think that what it should say is that there will be 20 meetings, mm -hmm. two each month during the 10 months, and that we will, when we set the calendar, we will set the dates so that we can look, because every year these things change, and it's really hard to say first and third, second and fourth, but if we just went through and chose 20 Thursdays, mm -hmm. if we do it early enough, that gives Mm -hmm. everybody who needs the dates, mm -hmm. the time, and I think we do need 20 meetings. I think that, you know, we've had shorter ones in the past, and then we always end up adding them, or I know as budget chair this year, I had to add two meetings because of them falling, and I hate it when they're back to back. It's like, we, it's hard to get anything done, and it's hard to, you know, have enough for a full agenda. Mm -hmm. um, so I would really like us to look at 
20 Thursdays, you know, trying to space them out and, and having two a month in the 10 months that we meet. Mr. Schlickel? I, I, I like that idea a lot. Um, I, I'd like to expand upon it a little in that if we talk about having 20 Thursdays, yeah. so that it doesn't even have to be within the September to June. Right. For example, we might want to meet the last Thursday of August. Sure. Uh, rather, th you know, in advance of, of opening, opening school day. when the teachers are coming in because there can be lots of issues at that point in time that we need to deal with. Uh, the other out-of-the-box solution uh, would be instead of second and fourth, uh, go for the last Thursday, when that, especially when that lands on a fifth Thursday because a fifth Thursday usually doesn't conflict with anything else that they're scheduling second and fourth, first and third. <laughs> That's true. They're so free. that on the months where you have five Thursdays, we'd go, we'd go land on that. So if we were in, under this paradigm being very strict, we'd go second and last rather than second and fourth. Right. Uh, or the last available Thursday, so that when we have a holiday on a Thursday, it would be the last legal Thursday, but right. that, that's sort of a more constrained paradigm, expanding it out to just going through the calendar and picking 20 dates uh, that align to the business of, of the committee would be a way to do it. Another way to do it is to just say, we are going to meet on the last Thursday of each month and then and have that as the official business meeting and in the places where we need to ad schedule additional meetings. Uh, really not have those agendas fill with actionable items, but in terms of reports and discussions, add a second meeting to the calendar, which is more uh, a discussion meeting and conduct the business at the end of the month. Just so you know, though, there are three months where the last yeah. Thursday is well, not... Our last legal Thursday, so that if that last Thursday is a, oh, a holiday, a you know. But we, we can play with it. But I think what we should do is there's so many ways to play with this is that we should either do it in, um, in, in the subcommittee or engage in further discussion at the retreat. So what, I mean, are people comfortable with the motion to move this to policies and procedures? I mean, so I, I'm going to move. The, no, you're not. Uh, well, well, just one question. Is it is the intent of the committee to resolve this mm -hmm. so that we present to the superintendent with a calendar? Mm -hmm. yeah, yes. So I, would, okay. I was going to put a time certain. Yeah. Great. Yeah, so I'm going to move that uh, the policies and procedures subcommittee come up with a policy on the calendar by no later than our next meeting. The June yeah. meeting. By the, oh, by the, by the June okay. meeting? Yeah. Well, I no. think you, Two weeks. You, well, they yeah, have, we they're going to present the calendar to us at the, at the next meeting. Yeah. And then the, the final, we're going to finalize it in June, so you need it before the next meeting. Yeah. Okay, by the next, what do you think? Mm -hmm. uh, the next meeting. By a day or two. I mean, what do you, I mean. Well, you want well, the packet no, sooner no than that. On the, the Wednesday before, mm -hmm. so that they can produce the calendar. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I mean, you think welcome back as the chair, Joe. But, uh, Mr. Chair. Yes. Well, we could also have the committee do a policy, but just for this year, figure out what days you want. Mm -hmm. uh, you could do that too. Mm -hmm. But if you want to first read the calendar the next meeting, that's only two weeks away. And besides, when you do a policy, you have to have a first read and second read yeah. too. But, so why don't why don't we do this? Why, why don't why doesn't the po policies? I think some subcommittee. What subcommittee is going to meet? If there's any other committee meeting to kind of talk about this in more depth, that's what I was talking about. There's no one else, no, no other committee has a, a okay, so we'll have to meet in the next yeah. two weeks. Okay, so I move that the policies and procedures subcommittee meet within the next 10 days, uh, two weeks, and uh, prepare a recommendation for the calendar for FY15. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? So notice it's not a policy, it's just a recommendation for the right. county. In keeping with what the superintendent said. Well, I want you to look at the policy, okay. too. We will. Okay. Awesome. All right. Um, we also want to talk about conference dates and release dates. Um, we have done a lot of discussion with curriculum leaders, with principals. Uh, it has been a, a major topic. and. Laura has done some work with the curriculum leaders, particularly at the elementary level, about what their needs are with respect to curriculum. I'm going to ask you to talk about that. You have this 
in your pack, well, actually it's at your table, because it's been an ongoing document over the last couple of weeks. Um, it's more just giving an overview of what are the curriculum needs for professional development mm -hmm. um, at the elementary level. And then we'll talk about what the, what the significance of that is in a, in a minute. But you might also, even before we get there, do you want to start with where, what the issue is in uh, the district? All right. I, I really wanted to right. just present to you the kinds of data that we're collecting and get feedback from you about whether there's other types of data that you would like us to take under consideration as we build this calendar. Um, and so I, again, apologize that you didn't have these earlier, but the ex particularly in the terms of the curriculum PD needs, it's been a reiterative process and we, had we did not have an opportunity to meet with all the stakeholders prior to um, tonight. So that's why you're getting that late. Um, I just wanted to, to show that one of the, the questions we've had is comparable districts, and these are the districts that we compare ourselves to when we look at our MCAS results. That's the second page. You know, what are the um, early release days that they have? And I've also included um, the percentage of free um, and reduced lunch that those, that district has um, because a number of times members of the committee have raised concerns regarding um, working parents and the impact of early release days uh, to those folks. So uh, we wanted to make sure that you, you know, you can see what the MCAS scores are for, again, for overall for those districts. You see how many students they have, the percentage of free and reduced mm -hmm. lunch, and then how many it's early release students days students that those have. folks have. It's the second page of this document. Hmm. Um, and, and then the first page of that document outlines my discussions with the elementary principals, with the curriculum leaders, with the literacy folks, with the math coaches, um, about the number of early release days that are strictly for professional development that are necessary. Mm -hmm. um, as you saw when you uh, created the, the document that you brought to the Hill, the amount of effort that's needed to implement the Common Core mm -hmm. deeply in the classroom and to measure progress towards it is um, significantly more than it took to just align the paper documents to the curriculum. One of the things that we have really learned is that the, the needs can be a little bit different um, around time for um, professional development. The need is there, clearly. Um, let me actually start with the high school. At the high school level, teachers teach at least three different courses and different preps anywhere from grades 9 through 12 and that's pretty common through most departments except probably for English language arts where they might have a 10th you teach just 10th grade or 9th grade but what what is very difficult at the high school and in fact it, I, I don't know of any high school that can accomplish this is to schedule common planning time mm -hmm. it's just not possible so for planning time for high school teachers, the only way that they would have time would be in any kind of meeting times. We have three a month, three different went three Wednesdays, or the time that we could have in an early release day. And then we're constrained by making sure that we um, meet our 990. I, I will tell you that we're fine with meeting our hour requirements at all levels with the professional, the early release times that we have right now, or the release times, I should say. Next year, um, one of the things we're thinking of experimenting with is maybe having one less um, early release day at the high school and putting it in delayed openings where there might be one per quarter of a delayed opening so that um, teachers that teach the same course would have an opportunity to have some common planning time. Um, they, they, they re there's a very um, open reception to this at the high school because they're fresher and everybody could be there at the same time and we know where the students will be then. So that, does, that model doesn't work as well at the middle school and the elementary and that's the feedback after much discussion we've received. So we we're, and I want to go back to some other data that we've recently had. We did a survey, and you've seen the results of that survey on professional development, and also one of the, the issues that's come up in the tell results from the district. Now, I'll talk more about that at, at next, another school committee meeting. But the, 
the need for common planning time and also some professional development that is also um, more, more directed by the teachers is something that is very loud and clear that we need to be doing. Yet, we also have the constraint of only so much time, and as you can see with this list here, this is just elementary, the needs for um, curriculum professional development that is aligned with the Common Core's frameworks. And if we're introducing a writing program, which we have, Lucy Calkins, that's not something that you just do professional development f for one year. This requires multiple years of sustained um, professional development. If you're doing anything with the, the Common Core Mathematics, the same, the same idea. We we're, have we're a change in our science standards, and in fact, the proportion of science may have to shift in the years going out because we need to um, get professional development on the engineering kits. For example, we have the Museum of Science. We, we, we have done some of that. So there's this, but then there's also a need for teachers to ha be able to do professional development that is uh, aligned with their individual needs uh, or interests. Which, So I can't see the district cutting back on the amount of release time. The question is really how could it, how is it going to be allocated for what needs? And um, so that's, that's the issue here. And, and so when we come to you with the early release days, we'll have them designated for whether they're curriculum or conference, which is one of the things I want to talk about in a second. But the one thing I wanted to ask you is, how would you feel about the idea of experimenting next year with some delayed openings at the high school? That'd be, right? That'd be. I think it's a great idea. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think the kids would love it. Mm -hmm. I mean, my son is a junior, and I don't know, he has something where he has a study first block. He's and open. Somehow open. that means mm -hmm. he gets to come in late mm -hmm. a couple of times a week, and it's just, he's a different kid when he gets, mm -hmm. you know, another hour of sleep. You know, mm -hmm. when I'm waking him up at, you know, 7.30 instead of 6.30, it's just, you know, it's great. So I think that they would love it. I think it's perfect. It's a great way to kind of give the kids the time where they can use it because a lot of them when we do have half days leave and then come back for sports mm -hmm. and other things anyway so the fact that instead of just having a chunk in the day mm -hmm. they would start later and then they would just have the rest of their yeah. day it makes so much sense because one of the other issues we have at the high school are coaching even though teachers are not um, they they still must go to professional development and skip practice when games are scheduled by the league they can't skip they can't right. skip yeah, those. Yeah, we have that same problem that happened. Yeah, and so this might change things a little bit so that they, there'd be more opportunity for everybody to be there. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Go ahead. This isn't speaking to your point, but I had a question just to think about. Is this just stay on that for one second because I was just going to ask a student rep. What he thinks. Oh. Yeah. How do you feel about the, that issue? Some days we have early release days. In other words, you'd go home at noon time. Uh, One. And that would be the end of your school day. Instead of putting it at the end of the day, you'd, you'd start the day later.
I just have a question. Uh, uh, what would be open in the high school? So what would students be able to do? So could they go to the media center, for example, to get something done? Or would, it, would they not have access to that? Um, there's going to be, have to be something open with some supervision because we really won't be able to change the Metco buses, for example. Right. So, and that would, so that would, we would, we would need that and there would have to be very, you know, definitive places that you could go as a mm -hmm. student. Most likely it would be the media center. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. I'll, I'll I, open it up for other questions. Later. I have other questions. Okay. So I'm looking at this calendar and it has the nicety of ending in June 17th. And I realize that you're asking for a lot of half days for the elementary school students. And I remember asking a long time ago about how many half days, can, or when I say half days, I mean early release days, um, how many early release days would count as a, how many would you get into a full day if we took a full day of professional development? And I realize there's contract issues and everything, but I'm wondering if there's any possibility of taking one more full professional day and getting rid of some of the half days uh, mm -hmm. or some of the early release days. That will not count as a school day. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, I, know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. I realize it would push so it, but we're not. That, that's a major contract thing because you'd be literally adding a day of prorated pay. It would cost us about. Yeah, we actually looked at that, mm -hmm. um, that because a teacher, we had a professional development survey that we did, and one of the suggestions the teachers had was to add that a couple of teachers, um, and it would cost us in the neighborhood of one hundred and fifty to two hundred thousand dollars for an additional day. Okay. It's just outside the contract. Yeah. No, I, I realize there's contractual things, but um, there's, there were pluses too. It was it was seen when we when I asked the question, it was seen as a much better thing than having a whole bunch of little pieces. Oh, so we would like to have some longer days too. We're actually doing some other creative things along those lines, though. Um, we, for example, in the math department um, at the middle school, we the the director has created a professional day for a grade level to come and meet for the day and we get subs for that whole grade and we're doing more we've done of that a fair amount it's so we can do it it's manageable if it's for a small group but it's too expensive to do it for a whole school system mm -hmm. that's the issue uh, actually i have a, a few things a comments and some questions um so I'm in, in favor of professional development. You don't have to sell me on that idea. That's, it's great. We definitely need it. We need common uh, time to meet. Um, hanging on the playground, I think parents' frustration is often, we have a lot of parents who work part-time. So a full-time, parent who works full-time usually has accommodations and it's very easy. But if they work 20 hours a week, then it becomes very difficult. Um, and I think what I've heard from parents is that they would love the if there was some place that the kids could go, some sort of option for them in each school, you know, that when there's an early release, there is some activity that's being offered by, say, the Boys and Girls Club or some, something, or, you know, there certainly are um, organizations that bring programs into the elementary schools, um, and, and maybe we could sort of seek to see whether that's a possibility here. Something to look at. Uh, pardon? Something to look at. Well, it's something to look at. I think it would have to be heavily, parent component though of doing supervision mm. and keeping in mind that we at every school we have an after school program in which we have but this is not accessible to these parents right they after, they can't the after school programs are filled they can't just go to the after school program so so I'm thinking so most of the elementary schools have things like language or extra activities right that are after school um, through, the enrichment. And I'm, I'm blanking on the putting the enrichment, yeah, putting the enrichment earlier. Yeah, just bringing in some special things during those days. Um, something because something because we can look. That's we something we can look at because, because we have a parents who have access to the after school. They're fine. There's no mm -hmm. problem. It's these sort of parents who, trying to juggle it, that it's really stressful for. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can. I can. As you know, we have a, a, a enrichment program in all of our schools mm -hmm. after school. And we can talk about the possibility of doing mm -hmm. something like that. I think yes. that would alleviate a lot of sort of stress and anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, but then I have questions. I don't quite understand this sort of 
this thing. So what's the relevance of, so first of all, I see the number of students is elementary school students or? The total number of students in the district. Okay, so we were saying Arlington is These listed as no. 25, yeah. 36. It's gotta be right. elementary. I might have taken our elementary numbers, but the numbers that we have there are the, so the other ones are, are total and are no Lexington. Are those the I don't numbers think so. Who Lexington take the test? is what? That's the, no. thank you, Mr. Schleckman. He is exactly correct. Those are the numbers of students who take the MCAS test. Oh, oh, thank the you. MCAS. MCAS. Oh, so I, actually, I just don't well, understand. Our students take MCAS because, because they're not kindergarten um, students. Don't right? Yes. They're not so first grade. It's grade three, three through eight and ten. Yeah. Oh, so I'm, I'm just, so what is being, so what's the purpose of, of these numbers? So why are we looking at MCAS results in, in relation to early release days? There was some discussion in the past about the um, impact of early release days uh, and the work that teachers did on student achievement and if there mm -hmm. was a direct correlation, it's a weak correlation at best, but, mm -hmm. but just to look at the surrounding districts, these are the districts we compare ourselves to on a regular basis when we look at our MCAS scores. Okay. And so you'll see that we're just as most of our MCAS scores are pretty much, or at least in the, in the English language arts, we're pretty much in the pack. In the terms of early release days, we're pretty much in the pack. Mm -hmm. It runs all the way from districts that have four times a year, but they actually release earlier mm -hmm. to districts that release early every single week. So, so there's been an argument made by somebody that um, releasing kids earlier is, is hurting their MCAS or helping their MCAS? No, there was an argument made that the, if the teachers have more time to work together, it that increases it their ability to be it's effective good for them. in the okay. classroom. And then what's the relevance of the low, in, low income numbers? Um, again, this was to uh, generally the higher percentage of students who are on free and reduced lunch, the higher percentage of working parents and, and dual working parents, mm. and what the, where the, there would be a, a stronger impact. I see. But again, I feel it, you know, it, I find it, I'm not sure that that's it, so it, obvious. Yeah, yeah, I find that very yeah. erroneous because all the parents that talk to me about wanting coverage are not, would never even qualify that they're higher income. Yeah, it's, um, it's these 20 hour, it's the, the parents who work 20 hours a week that it's really difficult but, for. But, but it's, also, it's the people that work 40, they, they, both parents are working. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And that's where the issue has come. And I, I just find that I think the impact but coverage for the students is across the uh, the board um, the board on income. I don't think yeah, this yeah. is a relative thing for us yeah. to even. It's a, also if you're high income and your kids are in care, then it really doesn't matter to you, right? right? It's 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 more it's the other cases. But, yeah, it was just one yeah. piece of information. Right. We yeah, added. okay. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to speak to that same chart. Um, I appreciate that you have the district low income, but the point that we've made in the past about this set of comparables is that when you compare us on income, including all the low-income people, mm -hmm. this set of, of towns are significantly higher. Than, I don't think anyone has a lower income than we do on average. And I, my ballpark, just looking at the numbers, is they're twenty to $30,000 a year higher, I mean, just the average. Of, of these things, and I may be wrong, it may be higher than that. So, I'm talking, about I'm talking yeah. yeah or, I, I wasn't considering that. I, yeah, I just strictly looked yeah. at the percentage of It's just, it's one. something that you need to be thinking about because the, those income differences really make a difference in terms of what opportunities are available here versus all the other places with, with these mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that the, the we can even take the comment. I, 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 it's a very, there's probably no correlation with it, but the issue is really that one of the most important things that we do in terms of affecting student achievement is also to help our teachers have the time to plan, have professional development that's relevant to their practice and, con and content areas. And a high quality school system is going to be able to provide robust professional development and that's unfortunately that often means that you have to have time in the day to be able to do that it's very important at the elementary level to have all third grade teachers together for professional development you can take slices at the, at the secondary you can take just the ELL teachers in seventh grade but you can't do that as easily so the I think there's certainly enough research out there that correlates professional development to student achievement 
And it's significant. And I think the purpose of seeing this is just that high-performing school districts give time to professional development. And that's the point of this. Just five teachers once a week, 10 times during the year is 37.50. In other words, I base that on the substitute pay. So a grade, an average grade at the elementary wouldn't be any more than five, would it? Five? It would five, be like 20, well, 20 to 24 I, teachers. I thought you were talking about teachers. in the building to meet. You're taking put a whole, uh, uh, like a fifth, whole, whole fifth grade, grade at yeah. one time. Mm -hmm. Well, we've done that. Though. Okay, we I, have no, done I, that. I understand that. Mm -hmm. That that takes it up a little higher. But I was just thinking on a grade level, the Lexington school system has a half day every single week mm -hmm. yeah. at the elementary level. Yep. Okay, yeah. and they added 20 minutes. I like, I've said this before. Arlington had it when I did my student teaching here 40 years ago. They added 20 minutes to the school week, and that put that built in a half day every single week. They did all. Everything during that half day was very well organized. Mm -hmm. But one of the other ways is in, t in school, you gotta be careful taking too much, taking classes out on a regular basis because mm -hmm. that will have an effect on the continuity of education in the classroom. There are many creative ways. I don't think we're gonna solve them all tonight. Uh, I, I applaud you for bringing this here. And I think that the idea of doing it up front at the high school uh, may be something we, we may wanna even expand it later on as it goes forward. I, I see it. I don't see any downside to it. Mm -hmm. Anything for yes. I, I, you know, so my own preference on this is, I would like us to have uh, the same number, the, the same amount of professional development as the districts we compete with, um, and I. So that's my own personal preference. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to gauge how much this is going to inconvenience. It, 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 this is always an inconvenience to parents, mm -hmm. but I think as long as we know, several months in advance, and it's clearly articulated these are going to be the, the these are the early release days please plan ahead and it's sort of message to people as early as June um, we can plan mm -hmm. so that's the, the, the thing and I, I just want to refer the committee again to the article that I sent out last week from um, it's entitled killing mom softly with half days it's a really dead-on poignant article uh, in line with what Ms. Seuss was just talking about which is you know it the quote that really stuck out at me was um, they rearrange things because the work world is not conducive to school hours so rather than say let's change the system we change ourselves and I, I, I would just like to you know use the maybe part of Saturday morning when we're together to do a little bit more out of the box thinking on this okay. I, I think it's I, I, we can talk this all <laughs> tonight I, I, I appreciate everybody's input I think we, we have to also recognize we all want the upside of professional development. We also want to recognize the needs of parents and, and, and lives at the same time. It's a hard thing to balance. Mm -hmm. There's several of the things that have been offered tonight or discussed tonight have been creative ways of blending this. Uh, the doing it up front at the high school. Well, at the high school level, I think it has less of an impact on, on the child care at the elementary. And when, May, would cause the same issue at the front or the back end. Mm -hmm. But I'd, at this time, I'd, I'd like to leave it to the to our pros and, and mm -hmm. get feedback from them. Mr. Schleck. The only impact to doing an early, uh, a, uh, a, a, a delayed opening at the high school, on the same day we're doing an early release in the other buildings. Do that. We wouldn't do that. Okay, that's good. Uh, we find in Lowell that we have to align things because there are instances where we have high school students who are picking up or caretakers for the elementary kids and if, if they don't align we have a problem there but, they don't. Uh, but if we're not going to line that up I, I really do think that going for a, a, a delayed opening at the high school is worth trying and I think we should do it try it twice next year mm -hmm. uh, as an experiment and see how it works uh, and I think that eight is a, a reasonable number of early release days if they're predictable and, uh, uh, and, and, and with uh, a lot of advance notice. I would like the superintendent and the curriculum mm -hmm. coordinator to, to look at the idea and maybe give us the financial impact mm -hmm. of doing it during the day. With uh, subs. With, that, with substitute mm -hmm. teachers and stuff. School-wide, I think even at the elementary level, may be prohibitive and very logistically 
impossible, but uh, I've seen, and from my perspective as a teacher, inside one building, grade level meeting, uh, very effective. And then having system-wide, maybe once or twice a year for everyone to get together and coordinate. Just a thought. Can I take a point? <laughs> okay. um, so this is just a pie in the sky sort of fantasy suggestion, which is, um, that would satisfy a lot of people on a lot of, sorry, on a lot of different things that they're interested in. Um, to make the school day slightly longer, add extra recess. <laughs> <laughs> and make that time available, you know, if we can't afford it, but, uh, um, and make that time available for professional development. But um, the other thing I just wanted to ask is, do we get a list of sort of what's um, planned for professional development at the beginning of the year? Is there, does that usually happen? So we actually will have a professional development calendar that will be available in August, and it will tell you what we're doing um, for each grade level. For okay, so we'll, we'll know and be able to, okay. Yeah, that, that was the other thing. Sorry. Yeah. Further on that. Uh, one, one more piece on this. Um, you mentioned eight, Paul. We maybe, when we put the conferences in, it might not. We are going to experiment with one thing at the middle school next year, a little different. Um, we're going to have a morning for conferences where the kids are there, mm -hmm. and they're going to have some kind of an assembly with people who don't normally have parent conferences doing it so that the, there'll be a morning which will. Um, shorten up the early release piece of it because this year one of the things we found is that uh, doing an early release that had three and a half hours was too long. Mm -hmm. So in order to get the extra time, I don't want to do another early release, mm -hmm. so we're going to experiment with this. So we're experimenting with something at the high school that's a little different and at the middle school, and I think the elementary is going to pretty much be the same. Except for the elementary, we're going to go down one parent night. Mm. Okay, that's it. Cool. Uh, I apologize to you, uh, the committee and to uh, people at home that I was not here earlier. So, if you've already covered this, did you have any discussion over uh, the meeting that Mr. Fitzgerald and I went to yesterday with regard to uh, going paperless? No. No. Uh, but I was going to bring it up on Saturday, but I know one or two members may not be here Saturday. If anyone would like further information, we were. Uh, Three vendors we were online with them and uh, discussing what they could offer. Uh, before we take, uh, make any full decision on it, I would like to uh, ask any member of the committee that would like to contact me, Adam asked me to be the conduit, uh, that he would try to give you a, uh, a showing of what was presented to us. It won't be the full thing because you won't be able to interact with the vendor, but uh, for you to get a chance to see that. And I apologize, it was, I misunderstood he, yesterday he said it should have been open to the whole, anyone that wanted mm. to come. I don't know where we would have fit them in the room because uh, we, we packed a little room that he had anyway. But let me know in the next day or two. Uh, you can do it on Saturday again if you can. Just send me an email on that. Uh, I was impressed. Uh, the bells and whistles right down to pressing a button for us to record our votes by name and it can go up with like the poor Karen. Uh, she's the one we have to make sure uh, we're the users. She's the doer, among other things. But he was very impressed uh, with that. Um, do we have anything for executive session tonight? Did you, I thought, do you want to talk about anything or no? I think we do. Okay. But the, there's no vote. The, 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 okay. Um, we will be entering the executive session to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with union and non-union personnel or contract or contract negotiations with union and or non-union, in which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect. To discuss strategies with respect to collective bargaining or litigation if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigating position of the public body in the chair so declares. We will uh, come out, the only purpose is to adjourn. Uh, we'll call to the vote. It has to be a lot of us. Oh, yes. to, to adjourn? Yes. No, to, to uh, enter executive oh, session. Oh, oh, oh enter executive session. Yes. 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 Chocolate almond? Yes.